Good evening. Welcome to the Northampton City Council meeting of December 18th, 2014. This is the last meeting of this year. Um, the, significant, the significance of that is next to nothing, but the fact <laughs> is it is our last meeting of this year. Um, <clears throat> we begin as we traditionally do with a period of public comment where members of the public are invited to come speak for three minutes or less on any topic. All that we ask of you is that <coughs> you respect the decorum of the chambers and that you keep your remarks under three minutes and you identify yourself with your address when you come up to speak. And um, the, uh, we have several people signed up and then if you haven't signed up, you're still not excluded. You, you, you are able to uh, speak is you raise your hand and we'll acknowledge you. And first up, because he was first in the building, is Mac Everett. Mac Everett, 40 Valley Street. Counselors, I have attended three public meetings on the proposed development of the Northampton lumber site. I think there's been general agreement on two points. First, whatever is built there will occupy a prominent spot, highly visible from both north and south. Secondly, the site's proximity to downtown and public transportation make it a great location for much needed affordable housing. A team from Davis Square Architects in Boston has presented a proposal for the project which has had preliminary approval for a grant of $300,000 from the Northampton Community Preservation Committee. At last week's joint meeting of the Planning Board and the Central Architecture Committee, Central Business Architecture, excuse me, local citizens and committee members, while endorsing the mission, critiqued the current proposal in great detail. Some expressed serious reservations. They proposed a number of constructive changes that they felt would align the final design much more harmoniously with our historic downtown. We are fortunate to have CBAC appointees who are highly experienced with architecture and design. I believe they are committed to protecting the legacy that makes downtown Northampton such a special place. The rest of us and the team from Davis Square Architects should listen carefully to them. If you have not yet done it, I would urge you to review the videotape of last week's meeting. Some other property owners on Pleasant Street have gone to great efforts to restore older buildings. And designs like the storefronts and apartments along Strong Avenue that back up against Union Station show also that modern buildings can reference our heritage and fit well with older buildings around them. CPA money may be spent to fund affordable housing. This project certainly meets that criterion. CPA money is also used to preserve historic sites. Isn't our core downtown in essence a historic site? Many of us think of it that way. Preserving its integrity is an ongoing responsibility. Before we use CPA money to help fund this project, we deserve a serious, thoughtful response to the design concerns that have been raised. To their credit, the Davis Square team has promised that. They indicated several times they would take feedback seriously and make changes to bring back for our review. Let's see what they put on the table. A building of this size is going to tower over everything near it, at least in the near future. It will make a major statement on a main entrance to downtown. I urge you to let the design process go further before we commit funds. Let's end up with a building that will fully meet the spirit of the CPA and be a real asset, both functionally and aesthetically, for a long time to come. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Uh, Mike Nagy is next. And, Your Honor, can I impose on you before you run out to sure. get the microphone for Mike? It, it'll pick you up from there, Mike. Uh, Mike Nagy. 20 Hampton Avenue, Ward 4. I want to speak to item 14.328, order for 99,900 for Forbes Library Elevator Project. In his will, 
registered with the Hampshire Probate Office on March 13, 1881, Charles Forbes left, and I quote, $220,000 for the purchase of a site and the erection of a building, for the accommodation of a public library, and for the purchase of books, etc., to be placed therein for the use of the inhabitants of said town of Northampton and their successors forever. It is my design to form a library of works of science and the arts in their broadest acceptation of ancient and modern history and of the literatures of our own and other nations. From time to time, rules and regulations will, of course, be adopted for the preservation and use of the library." Close quote. Uh, this is a time for the preservation and use of the library. The addition of an elevator will provide those of us with mobility disabilities much, much easier access to, Forb li to Forbes Library. I think Northampton should become a city that is welcoming and accessible to everyone who lives here or visits here. Um, I want to thank the council for their action on this project to see it through to its completion. Thank you. <coughs> Nora Kalina. And, and the mayor will be the AV geek. Nora Kalina, 8 Middle Street, and I'm back to speak about Middle Street parking. Thank you guys again for the time. Um, as I mentioned last time, we've been asking for assistance for years on this issue, uh, this particular business in Florence um, that parks on our street uh, all day does not have enough parking for its employees. Um, and this has become a burden for the folks on the street. If you recall, 77% of the people who live on the street are in favor of passing the ordinance um, that the DPW has also um, recommended. 77% is not insignificant. All the other businesses in town do have the correct amount of parking. I think about the new construction um, at the corner of Main Street uh, across from Birds, which actually had to reduce the size of their footprint to accommodate for the proper um, parking for folks so that they wouldn't affect downtown. And we're asking for the same for our street also to not be burdened, to increase the safety and not make it so dense and not make it such a narrow street all day, every day. So thank you very much for your consideration. I appreciate it. Thank you. Mary Finn. Um, and Mary, are you speaking for Jordy Harold? Is that what you wrote here? Is it? Yes, he contacted the clerk. Okay. Yeah, we have a copy of his remarks, but you have the floor. Before I get my timer going, um, when I speak, I'd like to refer you to the Community Preservation Project proposal paperwork, and I have copies of that here. If you don't, um, it might be helpful for me to have you. Uh, you're welcome to start. I'm Mary Finn, co-owner of 274 Pleasant Street and a butter of the former lumber yard. I'm also a city resident. I urge you not to fund the Valley Community Development Corporation application for CPA funds. The proposal conflicts with the mission of the Community Preservation Act. Additionally, there are false statements in the application. I'd like to start and draw your attention to page two. There's a statement that says there is an endorsement of Northampton residents. That's false. The handful of letters attached to the application are not from property owners or residents. They are from politicians and people working in the housing industry. The business owners and residents in the, and neighbors are opposed to the development. The third bullet on page two, it demonstrates a high benefit cost value. This is false. 
The Valley CDC acknowledges on page six that there are design challenges that must be overcome and paid for. The most alarming expense would be the relocation of a 150-year-old, 20-foot deep storm drain. Also on page two, second to last bullet, it provides housing that is harmonious in design and scale with the surrounding community. Without your being able to review the Central Business Architect Committee meeting minutes, you counselors cannot yet fully know all the components of the design that are not harmonious in scale and design. The plan was critiqued extensively by the Architecture Committee for two hours. The project would be three times the height of my building, twice the height of the Eagles building. It would be 70,000 square feet. My abutting building is only 4,000 square feet. On page one, it says it saves resources that would otherwise be threatened, but the application does not specify a savings of resource. In <coughs> fact, it's destroying a mill building from 1870, which is in direct conflict of CPA funds. The Community Preservation Committee has recommended to you, the Council, to vote to fund this project. It is important for the counselors, though, to know that the CPC discussion included significant reservations. Devin stated that the proposal was problematic. Another committee member stated that he would vote to fund it, but had reservations and hoped that the other committees and boards of the city would address his reservations. The Planning Board and CVAC did just that Thursday night. For you to approve funds tonight, it would go against your duty as stewards of public CPA funds. You don't have the information you need. You're lacking minutes of the CPC meeting, the joint CBAC and planning board meeting, and you're lacking an accurate application that is a true reflection of the proposal. This application is for a development that is not harmonious in design and scale with the surrounding community. The CBAC sent the Valley CDC back to the drawing board for a new plan. It would be irresponsible to commit local CPA funds now to a project that clashes with the mission of the CPA as written. It does not preserve historic buildings. It does not have a harmonious plan with the scale and design of the Pleasant Street Gateway. As stewards of the CPA funds, it's inappropriate for you to approve an award based on the current application. And I thank you for considering that. And and now you're speaking for Jordy Harold. So start the clock. Now again. I'm Jordy. No. Jordy. Okay. So I'm like a cool guy, right? Um, my I don't understand procedure, but I think this was sent to the clerk. We do. We well. have it actually for submission to public record. But uh, if have you're to read it. like to read it, go right ahead. To the City Council, as you consider the allocation of $300,000 of CPA funds to Valley CDC's Pleasant Street project, my name is Jordy Harold. I live at Three Massasoit Avenue. My property at One Short Street, which I have owned for 28 years and where I also lived for 10 years, abuts the proposed project. We are discussing a proposed single building that is between 10 and 20 times the size of any of its abutters and seven times the size of its largest near neighbor. I am not suggesting that the CDT abandon plans on Pleasant Street. However, I am asking the council not to fund it with CPA dollars until the CDC has demonstrated concrete responsiveness to abutters, neighbors, and city residents, and come forward with a redesign that makes a serious commitment to the CPA criteria of preservation, open space, and multi-use recreation, rather than overrunning those in the sole name of housing. I first reached out to CDC in fall 2013, and I have repeatedly reached out thereafter. I have been disheartened that there has been zero commitment, only, quote, openness to any modification I have suggested, and zero interest in discussing, let alone committing to, mutually beneficial results working along our 225-foot common boundary. The CDC solicitation of input from the neighborhood and abutters has been at best only to the letter of requirements and at worst terribly cynical. The earliest official meeting was October 30th, six weeks before they were requesting site plan approval, and over a year after the building plans were first taking shape. This cynicism continues with CDC meeting the CPA requirement for a public forum by establishing a meeting between Christmas and New Year's with the minimum of required notice. No doubt at that meeting, whoever can interrupt their family time to their third or fifth meeting will be, quote, thanked for their input. This does not equal any real possibility for the neighborhood to impact the publicly funded plan. I came to the CDC with 28 years of successful experience on Lower Pleasant Street looking for positive dialogue, and I do not feel I or any of my neighbors who have joined me in lifting this part of town over three decades have been met with a fraction of the way. Meanwhile, my tax and CPA dollars are coveted. 
I don't get it. Further, as others may point out, this is a $22 million project with a $442,000 per apartment cost and the merest fig leaf regarding mixed-use development. I may think more like an entrepreneur and less like a non-for-profit, but consider the following exercise. Just this fall, for example, Smith College put 30 existing downtown apartments on the market as a package for $3.68 million, $122,000 a unit. Even after making reasonable improvements and providing free heat and hot water and paying a management fee, this cluster would cash flow at affordable rent, which is defined as 80% of our city's $55,000 medium income with 30% devoted to housing. This is not to suggest the CDT should just leave the lumberyard, only that they should not be so tightly wedded to a monolithic, insensitive, and expensive design. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Uh, JP, you're up next. Are you the AV person? <laughs> Is it possible to get a few pictures up on the screen? <laughs> Uh, yeah, we're no, we're not quite as advanced as East Hampton, I'm afraid. That's oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll do our best without it. Yes. Thank you. My name is J James J. P. Kwasinski. Uh, I reside at 47 Hannenbrook Drive in East Hampton. Uh, my family is owned property on Hoyoke Street uh, for almost whoops, there goes the computer for almost a hundred years and is uh, a close of butter to the project at uh, the corner of Hoyoke and, and uh, Pleasant Streets. So um, I would like to start by saying I think the gate, the, the opportunity for working on your gateway uh, to the city is tremendous. This is a real, a real presentation piece when people come to Northampton to see the, this, this corner. I think it's an opportunity to architecturally uh, impact uh, what people view as Northampton and also I think Northampton of Northampton is a very progressive place I think of Northampton is the kind of place that probably ought to support mixed uh, uh, income development as a way of bringing together affordable housing with the marketplace into a single structure it really I think is the most progressive way to bring people into uh, conformance into, into being with each other uh, in a single building, uh, as opposed to taking and putting all affordable housing in one building. I know, I believe Amherst is doing some projects. I know in East Hampton, we're very proud of the Treehouse Project, which you may have heard of, uh, and has, has a mixed income approach uh, of some market housing, some uh, affordable housing, and really gets a chance for people to be together. Uh, I think Northampton is, you'll be discussing another item today uh, with regard, and it'll, it'll speak to Northampton being a retail, entertainment, and restaurant place. The place to be, in fact, in Western Massachusetts. What is that place standing on? What is the pillar that holds it up? Parking. If you can't find a place to park, you're not going to come to do business in Northampton. And then your downtown, where's your downtown? It was interesting to see, uh, read Bill Newman's store, uh, article in letter to the, uh, his, his article in the Gazette the other day, speaking to uh, what MGM wants to do and Springfield wants to do to Northampton. They want to eat your lunch. In order to keep Northampton competitive, I think you have to protect the parking. Unfortunately, with the Central Business District, the parking, uh, you don't have the opportunity to control parking. And this has now been zoned in the Central Business District. Before, where you had at least one parking space requirement, now there's none. Well, this project calls for 41 spaces in 55 units. Where are they going to park? I brought pictures of Kingsley Avenue, of Michaelman Avenue, of Randolph Place. There's no place to park. I think it's important to have some control over this project and would advocate that you either hold off or nix the current plan and look for a plan that's more compatible with the needs of Northampton. You have some leverage with your CPA funds. If you can use them to the betterment of Northampton, please do so. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, that's all I have signed up. Is there anyone else interested in speaking at this time? 
Pretty full room. Okay, honestly, okay. I'm going to ask the secretary to call the roll, please. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Carney. Present. Councilor Dwight. Here. Councilor Klein. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Murphy. Here. Councilor O'Donnell. Here. Councilor Shara. Here. Councilor Spector. Here. Um, we have no um, scheduled public hearings tonight, so the next item on the agenda is communications from the mayor. Your Honor. Move to approve them. What's that? You, I can't hear you. Oh, we'll, we'll get to the minutes. We'll we'll get though. We'll get there. Um, no, no communications from the mayor. Okay. There's no proclamations, resolutions, recognitions. But are there one minute announcements? Councilors have anyone? Councilor O'Donnell. Thank you. Um, on Monday, December 22nd, at 7 p.m., there will be a passenger rail forum. Um, there will be kind of two parts to this. The first will be a presentation from uh, an Amtrak officer on safety for when the when the trains start coming back more frequently to Northampton, and then there will be a just an opportunity to ask general questions about the return of passenger rail in the city. And so again, that's Monday, December 22nd at 7 p.m. at the Bridge Street School cafeteria. Council of Yes, yeah. um, I just want to do a very quick announcement. I want to wish all my residents in Ward Six. A Merry Christmas, um, Happy Holidays, and a Happy New Year to every resident in the city of Northampton, and also to be safe and healthy. Thank you. Um, any other one-minute announcements? No. Okay. We have no presentations. Nope. Um, and or license and petitions. So now, Councilor, I'll accept. Uh, Move to approve. There's been a motion to approve the minutes. Second. Second. Any discussion on the minutes? All those in favor of accepting the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? They pass unanimously. Um, any reports of committees or no? Uh, <clears throat> we have we come up to appointments, and this is uh, uh, the first is a new appointment to the Community Preservation Committee. And that's Tony Hockstad of 22 Fruit Street uh, in Northampton. And uh, will participate as the Northampton Housing Authority representative for a three-year term. Um, she will re replace Joseph DeFazio, whose term on the committee ends uh, January 2015. And Ms. Hockstad's term on the Community Preservation Committee will expire January 2018. And this is for a referral to uh, Ordinance. Move to refer to the committee on rules, ordinance, appointments, and evaluations. Okay. Councilor Adams. I'd like to thank Mr. DeFazio for his service. I I would second that. Joe DeFazio has uh, done yeoman's work in that, in that capacity for some time. <coughs> Any other discussion? Uh, motion. All those in favor, please say aye. Uh -huh. aye. aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? That referral passes on to ordinance. Uh, the next is a new appointment to the Northampton Arts Council. We have <coughs> two appointees, Cassandra Kellum of 222 Prospect Street in Northampton. Uh, this always already comes, uh, this is left, uh, this is to fill a uh, vacancy left by Robin Glenn. The term will start October 2014 to October 2017. And it comes with a positive recommendation for the Committee on Rules and Orders. Uh, Move to approve the appointment. Second. Uh, any discussion on the candidate? Um, no? Okay. All she those in favor? Thank for her willingness to serve. So. Noted. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? Cassandra Kellum is appointed. And next up is Esther White of 17 Summer Street, a term uh, to start December 2014, expire, uh, expiring June 30th, 2015, is the unexpired term of Sarah Marcus. And this is for referral to ordinance. I move to refer. Second it. Any discussion on that? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? <clears throat> Any abstentions? Um, Next up, we have an appointment to the Northampton Board of Almonds. Uh, Andrew Murray of 54 Day Avenue. Uh, this term starts November 2014, expires 2015 of November. Also, this comes with a positive recommendation from ordinance. Second. Any discussion on 
All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? <coughs> Any abstentions? Andrew Murray is now. Now, uh, we, next up is the approval of uh, committee minutes. Move to take as a group. Motions are made to take them as a group and seconded simultaneously. I don't know will you pick who do you want to be a second on that. Uh, I'll be a second. All right. <laughs> Councilor Spector defers to second. Um, any discussion on these? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? Any abstentions? Now is the point we recess for finance committee where I pass the gavel to figuratively to uh, Council Murphy, who is the chair of the finance committee. Can I have the envelope? Yes, you have the envelope. Take, the envelope. Take it away. Up in. Did you uh, follow all the finance? You've got to remember where we are. <laughs> Councilor Murphy. I'm here. Councilor Adams. Here. Councilor Labarge. Present. Councilor Shera. Here. Hello, President. Our first ordinance tonight is with regards to the James House. Uh, upon the recommendation of the mayor, order that whereas the city-owned buildings known as the James House on Gothic Street is suitable for educational and other public service uses to benefit the residents of the municipalities within the area formerly known as Hampshire County. And whereas three-year leases to educational and other public service entities will allow the city to preserve the James House while generating revenue for the maintenance of the building, and whereas Mass General Law uh, Chapter 30B, Section 16 requires a vote of the city council to surplus any public interest in the property prior to its disposal, now therefore will be in order that uh, resolve the James House property is available for six years for educational and other public uses. Uh, and that leases may be executed by the mayor. Do I have a motion on this to put on the floor? I make a motion. A second. Second. Okay. And the mayor is here to explain it to us. Yes, good evening. Um, it was actually six years ago that the first surplus order was done by the council um, uh, under uh, Mayor Higgins when this building was um, heavily renovated and major investments uh, were put into the building, um, primarily of CDBG funds. Uh, in order to try to create a space um, for um, educational and other uh, public service organizations. So um, we've now completed basically two three-year leases with the primary tenants in the building. We'd like to renew those leases. This is Center for New Americans um, and the Literacy Project primarily. Uh, we also have an, a new tenant um, who we are going to uh, uh, who's going to use some smaller office space in the building, um, and that is the um, Pioneer Valley Workers uh, Center, um, who uh, uh, fall under a larger umbrella organization and will be serving um, uh, primarily low-wage workers um, in Hampshire County. So it's a good. We thought it was a good fit for the building. Um, so in order to do these leases to renew a lease we want we need to come back and renew basically um the surplusing that has to happen saying you're surplusing it for for um for public use so that we can renew the leases and i know that some of you have uh i know uh, councillor labarge's committee has um met with uh, the two organizations i believe they're also recipients of cdbg funding so i know i've they've come before your committee um, I recently had the opportunity to attend uh, one of the um, uh, end of semester uh, celebrations for the Center of New, New Americans, and uh, they do great work. They do the, uh, the naturalization ceremony um, in town, and obviously the literacy project does great work in terms of adult education, uh, et cetera. So um, the building is paying for itself. The rents that we're charging are covering all of the maintenance of the building. Um, and, uh, and uh, it seems to be uh, working well. We're always on the lookout for other potential uses. We continue to have discussions with um, the colleges about running courses there. We've had, um, I believe the Red Cross has run CPR courses in the building. Um, so that's kind of the status, and that's why we need permission to, uh, to renew the leases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Oh, I'll defer to Councilor Labarge. Mayor. 
Are we on a three-year lease or this is going on six? Um, we uh, are finishing a three-year lease. Uh, we did two three-year leases. And so um, what you'll see that um, uh, you see at the bottom, we've resolved that we want to basically surplus it for six years, okay. um, just so that we would be able to do potentially two more rounds of three-year leases. Um, if that language is confusing to you, I could, um, uh, we didn't want to say six-year leases because we're not actually going to sign a six-year lease because um, then we'd have to come back to council to get permission to sign anything more than a three-year lease. So okay. I know it's confusing to say three-year leases, but basically what we, the law is three-year leases are the minimum without having uh, legislative approval. So we just completed a series of two three-year leases. So we were thinking, could we just get a surplus order that covers us for the next six years? Um, obviously, we will reassess between leases, but. Councilor Kearney. Oh, okay. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mayor. Um, I do want to point out that um, I'm fully in support of this project, but note that six years ago when we received that first grant from uh, the Executive Office of Labor and Workforce Development, then uh, Suzanne Bump, the Secretary, um, it was seen as a, a real positive step for the City of Northampton and Hampshire County, since Hampshire County was the one county of Massachusetts that didn't have a community college. So it, it seemed um, like a really worthwhile project to use that facility to be able to provide adult education at two Hampshire County residents in a way that they were then um, less than able to uh, attain. I also was very um, excited at the time to be able to get support volunteer work from a number of the local labor unions who, um, I think it was apprentice programs from the carpenters who helped demolish some of the, then there were cells that were holding cells that were still in the um, basement of that building. So it seems fitting now that one of the, one of the new tenants, as the mayor just pointed out, is the, um, the new uh, Pioneer Valley Worker Center. And it's almost a, a turnaround for them to actually occupy that space, as I know a really, um, they're very excited about it. I'm excited about it. I was able to stop by those offices a few weeks ago for a small meeting. So I'm in fully in support of us continuing to support the mission of that building, and, uh, and I think it's a great boon for the residents of the city as well. Councilor mm -hmm. Adams. What are, what are they paying the city for the lease? Uh, we have um, we have uh, rents that we established a few years ago, um, and it's a, a, about it's fifteen dollars a square foot uh, is is a, is the leases that we've been charging. We've been reviewing them um, on an annual basis. That's the uh, those are the rents that we established. I'm not I, I don't know the billing well enough to really be able to give a figure from, from to get a figure from that. Is, do we have a, a, a dollar do you value have total rents? I think um, I have Oh, I have it. Yeah. If, if, not, if it's not available immediately. If no, we can certainly be some kids. They, they, um, they have different size spaces, so uh, we, we calculate their rent based on how much space they're using in the building. So there's three different organizations, and they all have, they're all using different size space. Okay. So the, um, so the, Center, the for Center for New Americans, Americans it's about uh, just shy of $35,000 a year they pay in rent. Uh, literacy Project is 15000 um, and I believe the new lease we just signed, it's so new, I don't think we have it on this sheet, but it's two small offices, so it's probably, uh, you know, 1000 to $1,200 a month rent. Um, obviously, we're, you know, the mission, we, the mission of the building has to be because of the CDBG funds that we used, organizations that serve low and moderate income populations, and by default, Definition: Those tend to be nonprofits, and so we are trying to make the rent affordable for those organizations. Do, do you have any idea yet if, if there'll be rent increases or if, if you're going uh, to? We actually. Um, That's how much their the workers' center is going to pay. Oh, okay, six thousand, about about just under seven thousand dollars a year. Um, we didn't. We just. Uh, I believe we've. Um, I think we established. We, we, did, we, were, we did an analysis, yeah. and we kept you kept the rents the same for this uh, for, for this, this three year renewal. for this renewal. Yeah, I, think, I believe we're going to keep the rents the same for this renewal. Is where we are right now. Um, um, so, and again, I you know, unfortunately, on the other side of it, these are two of the organizations are organizations that um, 
we've tried to give CDBG money to over time, and we've in some cases had to reduce the amount that's available to them um, because of the fact that the pie has been shrinking of available CDBG funds. So, um, so to the extent that uh, so it seemed important to sort of keep the rent where it is right now because of other resources that are shrinking for these organizations. Uh, yes, please. Um, in addition to these three tenants, are there is there other space available in the building that's open? There's um, there is another space that um, if you've been in the building, there's an there's a daycare room that was set up, um, and that has been intermittently used. One of the goals has been to try to make that a more um, robust daycare. We initially had a grant through the um, through the school department. Um, Barbara Black, uh, the city's early childhood coordinator, um, had helped set up a daycare. The idea being that if you have adults that are coming in for these classes, whether it's immigrants coming for English classes or whether it's people coming in for just general literacy classes, and they have children that you could provide, you know, daycare during the classes. And so that was done intermittently. The grants dried up. Um, one of the exciting things in talking to Rose Bookbinder at the Workers Center is they're really interested in in the possibilities of providing daycare for their clients and potentially trying to work out a model that could serve the whole building. So that's still uh, the biggest portion remaining is that daycare room. Um, and we're sort of leaving that in place. Other than that, um, there's a shared conference room, um, and then there's a small kind of, it was sort of the court reception desk at the, at the, at the entrance. Um, and then there's classrooms in the building, but those are the shared spaces that, uh, that the various organizations use and that we uh, make available to, for rental for, for, for classes. And we've, we have had one uh, GCC class, adult class, that uh, uh, we, tried, we tried there. Um, didn't get a great response, so we're constantly talking to GCC and HCC about whether we can bring classes in there. So, so that, yeah, that's sort of um, uh, that space on the first floor is where the workers' center will be taking. Um, and then Center for New Americans and uh, Literacy Project are down on the lower level. And then the upper level is mostly classrooms. So. Councilor Klein. I um, understand that that building was rehabbed because it was a sick building and it had real mold infestation mm -hmm. and all kinds of issues. Um, and I imagine, I don't know what those costs were, but I imagine to have we been able to recoup the costs, I guess is what I'm asking, from all of the, re the remediation yeah. and rebuilding that was done. We also have done major energy upgrades to the building as, as well and got grants for that. There's actually PV on the roof um, as well. I don't know if we have the total. Um, the debt service on the building has been paid off. Yeah. So the yeah. So the money that we borrowed to do all those improvements has been paid off. So now it's literally just operation year-to-year -year operational um, <coughs> expenses. They just finished a project, CDBG funded, on the front porch. You may have noticed work being done on the front porch of the building. There's like columns, and the porch had all rotted away, and so they did have to do some work to, to shore up that structure. That was CDBG funded. But I think the building now is very secure, very energy efficient. We have a security system. I, so I think most of the major um, work on the building has been done to, uh, so I don't see, foresee any major projects going forward. Just the, you know, the regular maintenance that we'd have to do. And central services sort of oversees the building and, and does the, the maintenance on it. And the building is, is generating enough revenue. The revenue for the past two years has been about 50,000. The expenses have been in the neighborhood of 30. So we are building up money for future capital needs too. So we're taking that into account. We're not just trying to cop cover the current operating. We're trying to cover the full operating cost going down the road. Councilor Carney, did you have a question? Uh, just to point out in an answer to Councilor Klein's question about some of the work, some of it can't be easily quantified in terms of the volunteer work that was done by a number of apprentices as part of the, carp the carpentry apprenticeship program. And even I think there was some work that was done by uh, that was vo uh, offered by the laborers union. But a lot of that work was done in there really wasn't a, a way of measuring the actual uh, cost-saving benefit, but we just know that it was a savings. 
Councilor Labarge, do you have another question? Yes. Please. Um, I'm going to support this 100%. We were highly involved as councilors, I think you can remember, of how our previous mayor worked very hard for revitalizing that whole building. Um, we're making money to allow us to preserve that James house. That's extremely valuable. I have gone through there. I've toured it several times. I've also seen the daycare areas. We have good agencies that are in there. So I want to thank you, Mayor, for doing what we're doing here in the city of Northampton. And that is bringing in agencies of helping our residents and our children with affordable. Any other questions in finance on, on this one? Uh, so we have a uh, positive recommendation moved and seconded. Uh, there's no more discussion. All in favor? Aye. 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 And the next item in finance are all of the CPC items that will be taken up again later on in the meeting. And I'm going to ask your indulgence. I have to recuse myself on two of the items that are in here. It would make it rather hard to do that if, in fact, I chaired chaired the discussions on them. So what I would like to ask in finance, can we just forward these without a recommendation to the entire meeting and then, and then Councilor DeWhite will run the discussion and I cannot participate in the ones. I'll move to send them forward. Uh, I'll Council. second it. No recommendation. Okay. All right. Any issue with that one? All in favor? Aye. Okay. Then that completes our uh, agenda in finance. And we'll motion to adjourn? Move to adjourn. Second it. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you. So we go back into regular session. Um, <laughs> Council Murphy successfully abbreviated the finance committee meeting. <laughs> so, so we will take them in order. This is uh, the Community Preservation Committee recommendations for funding. Um, now, I know Sarah LaValle, I don't think, is here, but Downey Meyer is, so I would uh, request that. Move to recognize right. Downey Meyer. Thank you second. for finishing my sentence. Is there a second to recognize Downey Meyer, the chair of the CPC? Wait for a second. 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 Okay. second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All those opposed? Any abstentions? Downey, you, you may have the floor. I, do you want to hit these item by item, or what's your preference here? Um, I, you know, if, if you, you've already seen my letter, and I don't yes. know if you've reviewed the materials and the applications, but uh, I could recap them, or I could answer questions that you have. You know, why don't Why don't we address each one, um, and as we have questions, we'll we'll address them to you. How's that? Does okay. that work for you? Yep. Okay. Um, I think you all have copies. You all have copies of uh, Chairman Meyer's the letter. Uh, introduction of these okay yeah so first up let's let's go to uh, let's wander on over to the Bridge Street Cemetery that's the first item so this is um, whereas the Northampton Department of Public Works submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding to develop a preservation plan for the Bridge Street Cemetery and whereas the grant would provide a multi-year program to preserve or restore this important uh, historic cemetery and whereas the plan will include mapping historical research and gravestone and monument assessment and whereas on December 3rd 2014 the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $16,400 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support phase 1b and C phase 2b as outlined in the project budget now therefore be ordered that $16,400 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Department of Public Works for the Bridge Street Cemetery Preservation Plan, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, $16,400 is appropriated from the CPC, CPA budget reserve account. Um, there was a motion. Is there a second? Second it. Okay. Um, discussion. Downey, you want to speak to this a little bit? Um, so Bridge Street Cemetery is the uh, burying ground for some of the earliest residents of Northampton, um, and it also is still a current cemetery. So there is a lot of history there. Um, the Ward 3 Community Association has been um, organizing to try to do some preservation. The DPW has done their very best to preserve the monuments um, that are there. However, there are monuments that are in need of repair and they need, basically the first step is to have an expert look at them and assess what to do next. Um, the other thing is there's not actually a plot plan. So if you wanted to find a grave of a particular
person who was buried there, um, you might spend weeks searching for it. So that's, um, the mapping will actually be carried out with the assistance of Smith students and a professor at Smith, and that's going to be volunteer time that's provided um, to the city at no cost to prepare um, basically a GIS mapping of the entire cemetery and all the historical assets that are there. Um, and finally, the historical research, again, um, putting, putting into um, uh, a report, a comprehensive report, what historical assets are there. And of course, this is looking toward doing some sort of um, more comprehensive preservation work in the cemetery. Uh, and of course, without this sort of plan and this research, it wouldn't be eligible for grants from, let's say, Mass Historic. Uh, Councilor Murphy. Mm -hmm. um, for those that aren't familiar with it, it's, it's sort of astounding in Northampton. I mean, there were governors of the Commonwealth buried in that cemetery, the United States senators buried in that cemetery. Uh, Civil War, Civil War heroes. Heroes. Uh, it, it has a lot of significant historical figures in it uh, that we kind of have lost, lost track of, I think. And, and what's interesting is that it does, each section of the cemetery is actually um, designed or laid out according to the fashion of that time. So if you go back, you have a traditional New England cemetery and you move forward through the cemetery, beautiful you know, um, designs that was actually um, parks, American parks came from cemetery design. So Frederick Law Olmsted started designing cemeteries and then people adopted that um, for use as parks. So again, it's a very interesting property, but we don't have a lot of that information that's available to the public so they'd be aware of that. Um, the, I, also, for the record, and maybe I should refuse myself, there's a William Dwight Berry there as well from the Civil War era. But I know. I Any think, relation? Theoretically, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't get Christmas cards, so I don't know. Councilor LaBarge. Yes, um, I think this is great, Downey, and um, I do have some family members that are also buried there. Also, in Ward 6, we are looking also on the historical preservation that is on West Farms Road with that cemetery. And I'm talking about some old, old stones in there. And I think this is great that you're doing this. Thank you. We thought so. Councilor Shara. Um, I also think this is great. And, and so you said that starting this work will make it possible maybe to get grants further down the line to do more work there, like maybe beautification or it would be not, I mean, this is, as we've said, an amazing thing that we have in town and I feel like we could really do a lot more to respect it and uh, show it off as as the resource that it is. We are, we are hoping so. Uh, Martha Lyon, who is the landscape architect who is, they hope to engage, has actually done work um, producing plans for cemeteries. She did one in Amherst that started out with this sort of work and ended up actually with grant money coming from um, state agency to provide that sort of money for rehab. Um, so again, it is, you know, you're all aware of the Department of Public Works has many, many jobs in the city and they do a tremendous amount with a budget that they stretch as far as they can. But again, some of, you know, some of the work that they might want to do to even move this forward, improve its condition, this might make that available. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, one of the unique individuals buried there is Mrs. Childs who, you know, created Childs Park. And I know the crew from the park goes down because there's some that must be the uh, the park stage there because there's some very elaborate plantings around her stone and they maintenance crew goes down and takes care of them because it's a little above and beyond what the DPW does so any other discussion on this item this is for the approval of sixteen thousand four hundred dollars um, as recommended by the CPC uh, roll call please Excuse me. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adam. Yes. Next up, uh, that passes uh, in first reading. Next up is, and by the way, these are all subject to two readings. The next reading will be at our next meeting, which is January 15th. <coughs> so, folks understand the process here so it's not fully approved it is approved in first reading this uh, next up is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee and Mayor David J. Narkowitz uh, ordered that whereas HAP Incorporated submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding for 129 Pleasant Street affordable housing project and whereas the project will provide 
approximately 48 units of affordable rental housing. The units will be a mix of studio and one-bedroom apartments, 60 percent of which will be restricted to those households earning 60 percent or less of area median income. Whereas suitable affordable housing is a housing type that is in demand locally and regionally. And whereas the HAP Incorporated has an excellent record of creating affordable housing, and whereas on December 3, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $300,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $300,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to HAP Incorporated for the 129 Pleasant Street Affordable Housing Project for the creation of 48 affordable uh, housing units and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, $300,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve account. Uh, accept a motion? Second. Vote and second. You don't have to be shy. You can actually say loudly enough. To, it's uh, uh, discussion. Councilor Murphy. This is one of the ones I'm going to recuse myself. Okay. So Councilor Murphy is recused from this. Uh, she's, <laughs> you don't have to leave the room. You can stay. <laughs> this. Uh, hey, Downey. This is a project to replace the community housing that is currently at Northampton Lodging. Um, Northampton Lodging is, in fact, market rate housing. There is no affordability protection for that housing. Um, what HAP is proposing to do is replace that building, which houses approximately 52 tenants in SRO type accommodations, with a building that will be a mixture of tenants, 48, as you heard, will be less than 60 percent AMI, um, or eligible at, at less than or equal to 60 percent AMI. 24 of them will be market rate. Um, these will be one bedroom and studio apartments. Uh, I think it's important to point out that the Northampton investment in this project would be $300,000. The total project budget, if it receives funding from Department of Housing and Community Development, would be $23.4 million. Um, so this is one of these projects that is an extraordinary amount of leverage provided for the investment of CPA funds by Northampton. Councilor. And um, yes, uh, Dowdy, could you confirm, I, I, I read it here in the paper, but this project did receive site plan approval um, from, I, I think it says it in the resolution, but not only site plan approval, but also a special permit from um, Central Business Architecture. I, no, I know that they were going to planning. I had not heard from staff whether or not they had gotten site. Okay, and again, so, uh, I, and I, I'm only reading what I see in the Gazette. Right. Says. Um, of course, they would, you know, they have to go forward with their application to the Department of Housing and Community Development. They would never be eligible for that funding if they didn't get that, that site plan approval. So, right. um, as far as I know, there was, um, they had not, there were not a number, there are not a great number of concerns going forward. Um, this is a project that has been in the works for a while, and so I know that they were going back and forth with planning to make sure the project looks, looked appropriate, but I don't know for, I don't know exactly what the disposition was of planning. Okay. Thank you. They did get site plan oh. approval. The mayor just whispered to my ear, they did get site plan approval. Yeah. Thank it you. says in the newspaper, but yeah. I just wanted to hear you say it for the public. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Any other questions on this? Uh, uh, I'll just make a comment. Um, I've met with Peter Serafino of HAP many times, and this is just a really, it's a great project. Um, the neighborhood's excited about it, and it's a really great thing for downtown and for Ward 4, and I'm just really pleased it's going forward. Uh, did, have you heard any objections to this project? Uh, we we did not at our public comment. Um, we I, I was impressed at least by the fact that they had been in communication with the tenants in the uh, condominium building that directly adjoins the site, um, and that they've done their very best to keep them informed. And that m most of the tenants, I think we heard from uh, maybe five that came to our meeting, expressed uh, their their approval that this project would go forward, they think that would actually, you know, even though they'll be losing some view and some light because this, this building will be to their south, they thought that it's actually a, a, a good project. Council Um We also had housing partnership that came into social services, veterans, culture, and recreation yeah. with 100 percent of support of this project. Right. And we all know, living here in Northampton, we need this. There's no question about it. 
people cannot afford to live here and we're opening the doors and that's what we want not just northampton but throughout the whole region yeah, we, we i mean we agreed completely we have um in my time on the cpc we have approved smaller projects so four units here eight units there i mean this is the this is really the first large project and it is pretty ideally situated it's right next to the bike path it will be almost directly across the street from the train station it's near to downtown i mean as far as um, being housing that will work for the people that live in it again i would compare it to the apartments that are just across the parking lot here um, that uh, recently cpa money was invested in maintaining um, i think it's a project that, that makes sense and, and really does as uh, the councillor has said we have um, an extraordinary need for community housing um, in in the region so this will this will help a little bit to help alleviate that any other comments or questions uh, the clerk, call the roll, please. Councillor Dwight. Yes. <clears throat> Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Labarge. Yes. It's really, yep. Councillor O'Donnell. Yes. Councillor Sarah. Yes. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Uh, it passes unanimously in first reading. The, uh, I don't know if Council Murphy's planning on rec Are you recusing yourself from this one too, or are you? All right, okay. So we'll wait for you to get back. Actually, I'll, I'll read this as you return to your seat. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee and Mayor David Narkowitz ordered that, whereas Historic Northampton Incorporated submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding to restore, renovate, and stabilize basements, windows, and foundations, and protect historic artifacts. Whereas the grant would leverage $33,425 in donor grants, historic Northampton contributions, and volunteer labor, and whereas the CPA funds will be used to secure an important historic resource that is valued by the community and the region, and whereas all work will be consistent with the Secretary of, Interior Stan of the Interior Standards for the Treatment of Historic Properties, and whereas on December 3, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $176,465 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, it be ordered that $176,465 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to Historic Northampton Incorporated to restore, renovate, and stabilize basements and foundations, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Pres Preservation Committee of the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, $159,000 is appropriated from the CPA Historic Preservation Reserve. Are there any questions to start with? Downey, you have the floor. Okay. Uh, so moved. Second. Did we? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. There's a motion. <laughs> Thank you. I'm sorry. So the motion made and seconded. Now Downey. Down okay. Um, these are... Uh, rehabilitation for the infrastructure there namely the three buildings we have three historic buildings uh, the Parsons house built circa 1730 uh, this is actually on the Parsons lot that was laid out in 1654 um, there is the Damon house which was built in 1813 and the Shepherd house built in 1796 um, significant issues the windows of most of the houses as anyone who's lived in New England in an old house um, knows they're failing um, there are two problems with this. The water intrusion damages the structure and threatens the integrity of the walls and the floors long term. And also the collections that are housed inside the buildings um, are, are also subject to damage by insects, water intrusion, dust. Um, so part of this grant is to assess every window in these three buildings and remediate it. If the, if the windows can stay in place and just be rebuilt, that's what will be done. Um, if the windows, if they need to be replaced with something that, again, is consistent with historic preservation, that will be done. If storm windows are the best solution, that will be done. The secretary standards that are referenced in the resolution um, are required under the Community Preservation Act. Um, so historic preservation work has to be done consistent with those, which means even though it might be cheaper to do it in one way, you're constrained by the, by the standards. And that's something that the Historical Commission will be working with them to make sure that they do that. Um, there's also issues in the basements. The basements um, of some of these buildings, uh, most significantly the Parsons House, is in part a dirt basement. It's just pounded dirt. Um, and so you have issues with water intrusion, um, especially as people in Ward 3 know, the water table is very close 
to the surface, especially during the wet spring months. And again, water intrusion creates mold problems, and they have had issues with mold in the basements, and again, which will damage the collections if it's allowed to continue. Um, there's also asbestos, which is a life safety hazard for people who are working in the buildings, and so that needs to be abated. Um, and the last and the most significant part of this is the Parsons House is actually falling down. Um, the Parsons House, uh, there was an extension built on the Parsons House, and in, in best New England fashion, they laid the sill plate on the ground. So the sill plate that supports the entire outside wall doesn't have a foundation. It's just sitting on dirt. And of course, over time, that, that wood becomes saturated, subject to insects and mold. And so it's one of those things where you could take a screwdriver and just push it into the sill plate. It no longer has any structural integrity. So the entire back wall of the Parsons House is beginning to sag and beginning to pull away. Um, they have a, a expert in restoring houses who has already done some, you know, he walked in and did some immediate remediation work. Um, but that is a, quite a bit of the grant will be directed at doing a historical dig in the back of Parsons House, removing a porch that was added later, and then fixing, basically digging down, putting in a foundation, and putting a new sill plate to support that wall and basically preserve that house going forward. <clears throat> just, just a note, I'm, I'm glad to hear that the top priority for the windows is really to look at restoring those that can be restored, um, just because it's been a, a kind of a common practice place to immediately put in replacement windows. That, So I'm, I'm glad that the yeah. time's being taken to l evaluate and see what can be preserved from the historic wood and glass and a ab absolutely, material. Absolutely. And, and um, you know, that, of course, as, as anyone knows, that's often a more expensive mm -hmm. Uh, process because you are hiring somebody who is an expert to carefully dismantle windows that have been in place for 100, 150 years um, to reglaze them. But in the end, you get a building that has the historical value that you went in rather than something that has vinyl windows which may function but have no relation to the original building. Okay. Council O'Donnell and then Council Will Byers. Thank you. I also think this is great and, um, you know, obviously in addition to this being historic preservation, there's kind of an economic development angle, although I know you didn't consider that as part of your um, awarding of this money, but, you know, it draws people in from other places to come to Northampton to, to, uh, to look at our history. My question is, you know, surely $176,000 doesn't cover all the work that historic Northampton is gonna, going to need over time. You mentioned all, you know, the old New England buildings. So are you comfortable that this fits into kind of a longer term plan that historic Northampton has? Um, because there'll be other work that needs to be done. Um, absolutely. We, we did, um, Nancy Rexford, who's the um, acting director, we spoke to her about how, you know, how far will this go. Obviously, when you begin to chase problems in an old house, you need to assess um, what's, what's the total scope of work. Um, she and the, the carpenter that she's working with were comfortable that you know, this amount of money would get them stabilized. Um, one thing I should note is that there is an amount, some $33,000, that's you know, in their application here that's a match. But they have been doing an amazing amount of work, their personnel, um, that there's no dollar value attached to so moving the entire collection out of the basements. Um, you know, Nancy has bought the equipment and will be doing a lot of the mold remediation herself. Um, they're also looking at, you know, this is one of the things we talked about with them was, uh, trying to get for their collections a you know climate controlled building that might either be on site or off site, but that would they never have to deal with this issue of ha you know potentially exposing their collections to permanent damage, um, and this is something that they've actually investigated in the past, but it's never come to fruition with for historic Deerfield and other historic societies in the valley that would all benefit from having a central repository. Um, so it it seemed to us like. They had, um, you know, not just, they weren't just putting out the fire, but they were thinking forward and they did have a plan. That's great. And also should mention a plan to increase their connections with the community and make, the, make this um, historic Northampton actually something that more people are aware of. Of course, that serves a development purpose, but it also brings benefit. David Drake, the historical commission chair for our city, noted that in Hampshire County, this is far and away the flagship historical society. Um, that this is where people in this county come to. It has the most extensive collection, um, both of phys physical artifacts and documents. Something to be proud of. Yeah. 
Council of the Bar. Yes. Um, this needs to be done. There's no question about it. I did have some concerns um, family-wise where um, family has donated and there are artifacts there from those families mm -hmm. and we went in there like last year during the summer and could not find what the family had donated there. So my concern is if there is a value of antique furniture that's been given and there is a mold problem or and there's a problem in a basement, oh, I mean, where are they leaving the furniture? Do you know? Well, cur you know, currently a lot of it is stored in the basement. The, um, as, as Nancy Rexford explained to us, the, the leadership in the recent past has been, well, the last decade has been very focused on documents, on, on you know, investigating documents and producing books um, that they were not as focused on the physical collections. And she admitted that they have suffered from that neglect. But you know, her commitment is that going forward, that will not happen. Um, and that they will be, you know, and again, that's something that the Community Preservation Committee, um, that we feel, you know, an ongoing obligation to, as this project goes forward, make sure that when this, is, when this work is done, that those collections are preserved properly. Um, otherwise, you know, as uh, Councilor O'Donnell said, if they came back to us for additional funding and they had not secured the collections, we, we couldn't give, you know, we couldn't recommend additional funding for them at that point. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Other questions related to this? Uh, uh, just down again, I mean, uh, one hundred seventy-six thousand dollars cover. I, I, I'm rather astonished to think that it would cover uh, the remediation that you described of of replacing the sills, of, of building a foundation, uh, leveling off that space. That that I mean, that, I don't know where they're getting the contractors who will also do. Uh, they're doing assessment, replacement, and 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 also remediation that's already described in this and that that scope of work being covered for one hundred seventy-six thousand dollars actually um, pretty good bargain, wouldn't you say? Um, Chris and I, I, I hope I do not get his last name. Chris Thompson, um, for him, this is a real labor of love. Um, he's the carpenter working on this, and this is his specialty: is restoring historic buildings, and. Um, he, you know, he came and was with them at their presentation for the CPC, and I, I would imagine that his priority is to restore the buildings first. Obviously, he needs to pay for materials and he needs to stay in business and keep a roof over his head, but I, I think he's really passionate about making sure these buildings survive. Well, then he should be commended and thanked, I think, because really to get a, a projected cost estimate of uh, uh, the scope of work that you're describing is this is uh, very reasonable actually um, any further questions on this one point uh, Pam would you call the roll please Councillor Klein yes <clears throat> Councillor Labarge yes Councillor Murphy yes Councillor O'Donnell yes Councilor Shera? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. That passes in first reading as well. Um, next up, and I, I, it's been noted that there's a Scrivener's error on these. This is uh, when I read that upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, the mayor is included in here, but actually uh, by state law probably shouldn't be included because it wouldn't be the mayor's recommendation. This is only the committee's recommendation. So noted <coughs> that uh, that's Scrivener's error, and I won't include the mayor's name in the next one. So. so on all these, so on all these orders, the mayor shouldn't be included in these. Um, the next one up is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. Ordered that whereas the Northampton Historical Commission submitted an application for Community Preservation Act funding to submit an application for the placement of the Pomeroy Terrace area on the National Register of Historic Places. And whereas the grant would be used to hire the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to finalize and submit the application, and whereas the grant would uh, be leveraged. Uh, just, Councilor, uh, did you skip over the Jackson yeah. Street School? Yeah. So the, the, the Jackson Street is, uh, is listed yeah, on yeah, our agenda. Listed on your next. Oh, I yeah. double turned. I oh. double turned it. <laughs> That's the one I had thank open. You, good catch. Okay, thank you. Says, oh, all right. I'm sorry. Uh, we're going back to that. Yes. Jackson. I, I didn't get halfway through, so it's not retrievable. This is upon the recommendation of the Community 
Preservation Committee, and whereas uh, the Jackson Street School submitted an application for a Community Preservation Act funding to rehabilitate the school's playground. And whereas the project will provide funding for design and construction costs to expand the school playground so that the school, its neighbors, and all the city visitors can have a healthy, sustainable playground. And whereas playground development shall include provisions to limit any parking impacts on two adjacent neighborhoods. And whereas on December 3, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $176,271 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $176,271 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Jackson Street School for Playground Rehabilitation, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council, and specifically that $176,271 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve. I'll accept a motion. Move approval. Second. Motion's made and second. Any discussion on this? Downing. It's a playground. Uh, yeah. It's a new playground. Uh, it's an accessible playground, which will be um, which will be something uh, new for Northampton. Um, it is a replacement for the wood structure that I'm sure all of you saw driving back and forth on Jackson Street that was put up in 1994 when Gwen Agna, who's now principal at Jackson Street, was a parent. Um, and that playground structure gave many years of happiness to the children of Northampton, but it had to be taken down. And so it, it disappeared. And there is an existing playground um, that was built, the Agna playground, on the other side of the school. However, it's not of adequate size so that you could have the population of kids who were out there during a recess period comfortably play on it. So the um, Jackson Street PTO has um, been extraordinarily um, active in organizing for this. As you can see from the budget, they're um, planning to raise some $70,000 on their own to support this. Um, I don't know if you were aware, but on Valley Gives Day, um, Jackson Street PTO raised $24,000 in a single day. Um, so they, you know, they are to be commended not only for the fundraising, but also for the thought that they've given um, to designing this so that it's going to be a place where um, kids will play and also learn. There'll be an outdoor classroom component of this as well. Um, so, you know, we were impressed by the thoroughness and the thought that went into the application and, and recommended it. Councilor Carney. Um, thank you um, for your notes on this. One other um, piece that's not really mentioned here, but there's a real benefit to that neighborhood. In addition to just the school use, Absolutely. there's a, a lot of uh, kids right there at Hampshire Heights and, and also the, the um, neighborhoods on the back side of the school who would come in and use that playground on a regular basis. So it will be well used and appreciated. Absolutely. I just want to say that I too have been really impressed with the PTO and, and was blown away on Valley Gives Day that they've raised you know, close to $25,000. Um, and they're just working really hard and are super organized and getting it done. So it's great. Any other discussion? Comments? Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Sheriff? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Okay. Deja vu. This is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, whereas the Northampton Board of Public Works submitted an application for. Right, we're at that. We're at Pomeroy Terrace. Yep. I'm suddenly in Pulaski Park. Mm -hmm. a second. There. I don't want to keep flipping two pages. Uh, thank you all for your indulgence here. Uh, this is the Historical Commission submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding to submit an application for the placement of the Pomeroy Terrace area on the National Register of uh, Historic Places. The grant would be used to hire the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission to finalize and submit the application, and the grant would leverage $2,000 in additional funding from the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability and the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. And whereas on December 3rd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $4,375 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $4,375 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Historical Commission to submit an application for placement of the 
Pomeroy Terrace area on the National Register of Historic Places and that the meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, $4,375 is appropriated from the CPA budget of reserve account. Move to approve. So motions, second? Second. Discussion? Okay. Um, this is a project that began in the 70s um, and was moving forward as a listing um, on the National Register, but was turned down by the Park Service for inadequate information. They needed more information. <coughs> At that point, it went into hibernation for 40 years. Um, and recently, it's emerged from hibernation. Fortunately, the Park Service will accept all of the work was done, that was done previously, um, and they just want additional information. They want the application brought up to date. This historic, um, this register would cover an area that's the Pomeroy Terrace area, but actually would cover the cemetery across the street. It would extend up to 149 Bridge Street, so almost up to the intersection uh, of the next street north. Um, and it would also include structures on Phillips Place, Butler Place, and Hancock Street. Um, the National Register provides for you can preserve something if it's connected to a famous person. You can preserve it if it's connected to a, f a famous event. You can preserve it if, or you can register it if it is uh, going to save something. And in this case, this is the category C, which tells a story through design and through the layout of the neighborhood that tells a story about a certain historic period in a community's life. Um, and so the, the uh, Pomeroy Terrace is a, a group of structures um, from the middle of the 19th century that tell a certain story about where Northampton was at that point. Um, and so it's uh, important if it's listed in the National Register, it will be both um, eligible for potentially grant funding and for also some tax incentives. Um, you can get tax deductions if you engage in work to preserve these properties if it's on the National Register. Um, an important thing is that it doesn't in any way restrict the landholders at this point. So this is, you know, this is not a historic district. Um, this is just a listing on the register. If the city wanted to go forward with the historic district, that would be a different process. But for now, this is really a first step. Questions? Um, should someone do something that might not conform to a historic preservation standards, does that actually obviate their standing and do they get kicked off the register? Should they succeed? In that? Um, I do not know whether they delist you. I suppose they, you know, I'd, I'd have to, I could get back to you with the answer. I'd okay. talk to David. I mean, it's not critical that. for, at least for me. I'm just curious on that point. It, Someone, the, someone goes rogue, say. Yeah, the, well, the Park Service, their, their idea, this is under the, the National Historic Preservation Act that passed in 1966, and the idea was to try to coordinate state and local resources for preservation. So it was, you know, the idea was we as the federal government can't possibly preserve all these places, but at least if communities recognize that they're there, they'll take those steps. So, you know, I don't know whether you would lose your, you know, if you listed a building and you tore it down, would you still get to have the plaque there? I, I think not, but I'll, I'll confirm that. Any other questions? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labard. Yes. Uh, <laughs> is this where you recuse yourself? Nope. Okay. This is a uh, this is upon the recommendation of Community Preservation Committee, and the whereas the Northampton Conservation Commission, Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability, submitted a CPA application for purchase of a 58 parcel a 50 acre parcel to add to the Sawmill Hills Conservation Area, and whereas this parcel is located directly north of the parcel that was purchased in 2013 and will provide additional access and opportunities for connecting trails and serve as a continuing link with the Mineral Hills. And whereas the project meets the goals of the, of the Sustainable Northampton Plan, the Northampton Community Preservation Plan, and Open Space, Recreation, and Multi-Use Trail Plan to protect open space and provide for passive recreation, and whereas the Conservation Commission will develop a parking area and informational displays to serve users of the Sawmill Hills tra uh, Trail Network. And whereas on December 3, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted to recommend $116,200 
in Community Preservation Act funds to be used to, the, to support this project and now therefore be ordered that $116,200 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding of the Northampton Conservation Commission and the Northampton OPS for the Sawmill Hills Open Space Acquisition Project and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee of the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, $116,200 is appropriated from the CPA Open Space Reserve. Moved to approve. Second. Motion made and seconded. Uh, Downey. Um, this is a parcel that has a number of, of important aspects. One is that it has a vernal pool habitat, um, which is very important to preserve. Two, it has stream habitat, which again, in, in these sort of upland is, uh, is rather unusual. And it, it also has, um, for human use, it actually has access to Sylvester Road. Um, the Sawmill Hills has a wonderful network of trails, and the Conservation Commission has been acquiring property in the Sawmill Hills. And in fact, this property abuts one that was recently purchased. And, and again, it makes more sense for conservation land to be contiguous um, from a planning sense um, and from you know, people using it. But you can't park on Sylvester Road. Um, so it's hard to get there. So this actually has an area that already has, um, it's already going to be used for parking. Um, so it's, you know, from that aspect, it's, it's um, something the Conservation Commission was uh, attracted to purchasing. And again, I, I would commend the staff of the Office of Planning and Sustainability um, for continuing their, their winning streak um, in terms of getting um, a land grant for this that pays two-thirds of the of price. So again, you have the CP, uh, CPA funds, which we already get a, a match from the state, and then in addition we have the land grant. So we're, you know, we as a community um, are getting quite, quite the, uh, quite the purchase for a relatively small investment here. Council Labarge. Yes, I'm going to support this naturally, 100%. Um, the open space, the 50-acre parcel, it's just becoming bigger and bigger and bigger. And the connections, I think it's fantastic of having another parking area again, and you're absolutely correct. There is no parking area on Sylvester Road. Mm -hmm. And I would recognize the, the Reutners, the, the couple who actually approached um, Wayne Fyden at the Office of Planning and Sustainability um, with the concept in mind of actually um, selling this property for, for it to be preserved, um, which I, I think is uh, you know something that, that is that they should, they should be noted. Um, Thank you for pointing that out. Uh, Councilor Klein. Um, I understand that there have been uh, paths have been forged by people when it was privately owned that didn't have authorization to do that. I'm wondering if this funding will address those paths and create, um, create other paths or make something out of what has been forged? Well, uh, uh, you know, one of the things that when the, the Friends of Sawmill Hills, or you know, we, the Conservation Commission usually works with neighborhood groups. Um, obviously, if you have, you know, paths have to respect the wetlands ordinance and the wetlands law. So if there are paths that are crossing wetlands, then you need to revise them. If there are paths that are causing damage, um, then you need to think about how they would be changed. If there are paths that sometimes cross adjoining pro private property, those need to go away. So yeah, those are definitely things that are considered when the property right. comes. Also, too, we did have some difficulties on Sylvester Road with that, but um, and it was a surveying part of it of mm -hmm. trying to find the property pins, right. the city versus private property owners. <laughs> and I know Wayne Biden did get the surveyors out there to start marking and so forth, so that there, there would not be this problem of city property of open space going onto private property. Right. We actually, um, you you voted on our recommendation last yes. round for a comprehensive survey of the Sawmill yep. Hills properties. Right. Um, and what this will do is we will mark the properties with markers facing both directions. So one, as you're coming from private property onto conservation land, it says entering conservation land. When you're going the opposite direction, it says you're leaving conservation land. So again, if you're a user and you're on a trail, now you should be, and especially we would mark these at you know, trails, if they're leaving, um, they would be conscious now that they're off, off the city's land. Uh, Councilor Karn. Uh, just quickly, as a regular user of the uh, sawmills and, and the Mineral Hills areas, it's just an amazing um, network of trails. And if there was a wave for us to continue to encourage residents to make use of this resource, I, I think that um, I, I would just find if there's any way through 
the council, we can do that beyond just saying that we use them ourselves. Um, it's just really pristine, and the um, I, I laud the volunteer work and network that has been put together to create those, making giving opportunities for young people to do community service and trail building. It's just a fantastic project all around. Uh, Lori Sanders did an ecological assessment of the hills and took um, a picture of the cutest coyote pups um, that were all lolling in the sun um, as she was out there doing her assessment one day. Um, she said this was kind of remarkable in a town, in a city as old as Northampton, that this was largely just woodlots for the farmers who were on the perimeter and that there was never any road building, there weren't substantial structures in this. So, you know, it's, it's been part of the city for a long time, but it still has a wild aspect to it. Yeah. Um, I'd also like to know for the record, the police have returned our podium. We now have two podiums the other, it's in the hallway. So, I, by the way, it took two police officers to carry it. I should note that the mayor <laughs> carried this himself across the parking lot and down the stairs. So just that's for the record. Uh, Pam pointed out that I skipped yeah, the last yeah, part. So, so and I'm surprised no one screamed out loud. And <laughs> yeah, so yeah, it's all right. I'm so used to that. But this is upon the recommendation of the community preservation. I don't think we we didn't vote on Sawmill. All right, fair enough. <laughs> Thank you for catching that roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labard. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Passes in first reading. Okay. Damn it. Here's Pulaski Park. Uh, this is upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee. Whereas the city, uh, the Northampton Board of Public Works submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding that included preparation of design plans and construction documents for the proposed overlooked portion of Pulaski Park. And whereas Pulaski Park is an important downtown resource and the project will build upon the existing work and public process to rehabilitate the park as well as inclusion of an additional public <coughs> of additional public input. <coughs> whereas the project meets the goals of sustainable Northampton plan and the open space recreation multi-use plans and whereas the city Council and the CPA in 2013 granted $194,500 in CPA funds to support this project. And whereas on December 3rd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $54,000 in CPA funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $54,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Public Works Commission for the Pulaski Park renovation project and the, that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council specifically. $54,000 is appropriated from the CPA budget reserve. Uh, I'll accept a motion. Second it. Uh, Downey. <coughs> um, you have previously voted on our recommendation for design, work, and construction documents for um, the portion of Pulaski Park that is just outside this building, um, fronting on Main Street. In the process of doing that design, which involved several sessions of public participation, um, there was input from the public about the back end of the park that overlooks the current roundhouse parking lot. Uh, there was uh, interest in extending the park in that direction because it was sort of a, a messy edge um, that, that detracted from the current park. Um, Stephen Simpson, the designers, have looked at extending the park by grading that, taking that from what's now a steep cliff that tumbles down to the parking lot, grading it so it will actually become a south-facing slope um, that would have a walkway, an accessible walkway with, that would wind down and basically make it into um, another area of the park um, that would tie the park more to what's going on in the south. Now eventually there will be development in the roundhouse lot and um, this would actually provide something for that development to face rather than this steep scarp that would disconnect it from the rest of the city. Um, so and that, was the, that was the idea and the Department of Public Works came to us 
with a larger application, not just for this $54,000 um, in design to get design work and construction documents done, but also for construction funding of the upper portion of the park. Um, as you may be aware, the city has already received a $400,000 park grant that will fund in part the construction of that upper part of the park. That money will become available on July 1st, 2015 because it's fiscal 16 money. Um, so when we were looking at the application, what we decided to do before we confronted the, the larger chunk of construction money that was being asked for is we decided as a committee that we wanted to see the entire plan. Um, and so what we did was we recommended the $54,000, um, but we were aware that it is very likely, uh, almost certain, that the DPW of the city will return to us in the spring with an expedited application <coughs> for the construction funding. Um, and that we thought that we would be able to make the best decision when we had the construction documents in hand for the entire park. So our current, rec our current recommendation is to l basically allow them, allow the city and the DPW, um, the designers to get to that point. Um, it's rather important because they would like to get as much work done as possible during the summer construction season. Um, so they would like bids to be you know, prepared or the paperwork that to receive bids to be prepared early in the spring so they can get bids back and negotiate the contract so that on July 1st they can actually start. So we would expect them to get back to us sometime in February, um, late February, with those construction documents in hand. So we'll be seeing you again relative to this particular I, project. I, I, I just warned you. Yes. The heads up is noted. Uh, any questions and discussion on this? The uh, switchbacks conform to ADA grade. Yes. And, yes. That, and as I recall from the plants that they have, uh, they'll be uh, staging areas as you go up that uh, flatter areas yeah the, the idea is that the, is that you have the walkway sort of snaking down and that would be um, you know that would be ADA compliant but not just for ADA compliance that between sort of the S's you would have benches you would have areas where people could basically sit and enjoy the Sun because it's facing south um, you might also have activities that would take place you know you have sort of an amphitheater effect so you could have activities that could take place at the bottom of the slope um, so that, that's the concept. You'd also have stairs going up the right side of the slope as well. Um, again, we've seen conceptual work. They've gotten pretty far with it. But um, one of the issues will be exactly how much of that property will they put into Article 97 protection um, as a park. That's a one-way sort of process. Once you put property into Article 97, it only comes out with an act of the legislature. So that's one of the things. And, and exactly how much property is put into the park will determine some of those final design parameters. Councilor Shara. Um, I, I remember the moment when they first presented this idea of reclaiming this land that was no one had really thought to use before, and it was just this really exciting idea that we could this could be used. Mm -hmm. um, so I think this is really fantastic that we're. Yeah. And it also, um, as far as going forward, this would be partially funded by CPA money and also by another park grant that the city would be looking for. Also, um, as a brownfields area, there's. Um, there's other money that's available or it, it scores higher on the park grant evaluation because it's a former brownfield um, and so that would be another advantage in terms of the application going forward i hadn't considered that that's that's okay that's an interesting point okay any other questions discussion council labarge i think this is a great project um we've had many hearings on it and um, participation amongst groups and so forth, what we would like to see and so forth. I'm glad to see this moving. Any, anyone else? Roll call, please. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Okay, uh, second to last, upon the recommendation of the Community Preservation Committee, uh, ordered that whereas the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding to purchase the Seth Thomas clock, um, whereas the grant would uh, be to purchase the clock formerly located at the corner of Main Street and Strong Avenue, 
The privately owned clock was originally dedicated by Calvin Coolidge and sat at that location for nearly 100 years. And whereas the clock shall be uh, stored in an appropriate weather safe location that will preserve and secure it until it's restored. Um, and whereas the clock will ultimately be installed in a highly visible public downtown location, at which point a permanent historic preservation restriction will be created. And whereas the clock or any of its components shall not be disposed of without city council approval. And whereas on December 3rd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted five to one to recommend that $20,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $20,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to the Northampton Office of Planning and Sustainability to purchase the Seth Thomas clock, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee, the Mayor, and the City Council. Specifically, $20,000 is appropriated from the CPA budgeted reserve account. Um, second. Motion's made and seconded. Uh, Downey. Um, it is a street clock um, that stood for many years downtown. There are other examples in New England towns that were um, built by the Seth Thomas um, Clock Company. And it has been in storage. The city negotiated to purchase it. It's an arm length, arm's length transaction supported by an appraisal. And um, the Historical Commission supported acquiring this. It's entirely possible if the city doesn't acquire it that it will move on and be sold to some um, collector somewhere far away and it will never be accessible to us again. Um, we recommended $20,000 because the current plan is for the clock to be sited um, at an entrance to the newly uh, rehabilitated Pulaski Park and that that would be part of the plans going forward. Um, and so what we wanted to do was make sure that the part that the clock was not lost to us and that you know we would hope that the city would fundraise for that additional 10000 to put it back in working order and to put it where the residents can enjoy it once again. Councilor Adams. Where will it go and who decides where it goes? Well, that our condition was that it has to go someplace where it is safe. And again, that would be to our satisfaction. It can't go in a, in a shed um, where it's going to suffer further damage. Um, in the time that it's been in the storage, it has deteriorated. The weights um, for it have been lost. Um, so again, I would think this was something that we would look to the Historical Commission um, for us to get assurances or for us to get evidence that it's being appropriately stored. And, and, and for them to make the decision on location? Um, well, they would have to come to us and say, we're storing it at this location. This is where it is. It's secure. It's secure from damage from the weather. It's secure from theft. If it wasn't to our satisfaction, then they don't get the money. That's a condition of their contract. We sign a contract with them, and if they don't meet the conditions of the contract, then. Are, are you asking about the final location? Yes. Oh, oh okay. So the well, the final location, again, the final location would be something that um, it's, we did not put a specific condition in, but I would think that the Department of Public Works would be looking for public input and public approval of where it's finally cited. I mean, certainly, what we, I think in our condition, we said it would be prominently located. So we don't want it tucked away in some place where no one's going to be able to see it. Is the, is the Board of Public Works the best agency in the city to make that decision? Well, again, they're, they've, um, uh, yes. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Yes. <laughs> the actual, let me make sure, the, um, I'm not sure of who would sign, whether the contract will be signed by the department or whether it would be signed by the city. Um, again, at that part, the, at that point, the disposition of the property would be up to whatever agency signed that. Um, so again, we could, you know, we could look into this when we're writing contract language, um, if you wanted, for, you know, how, what process there would be for, ex for the siting, for choosing the site. That might be important. Um, could you describe the, the, the member of the committee's that, that did vote in opposition to this, what their concerns were, please? Um, the concern was that we didn't fund it fully. The concern was, why not just spend the 30, you know, why not just, you know, recommend spending the 30,000 right now to uh, acquire the clock and to restore the clock? Um, the other members of the committee felt in a round where, um, tr you know, typically we, uh, with uh, $1.3 million available, we spend or we recommend spending half of that. 
This round, because of the volume of significant and very good projects, we, for the first time, um, went past that. And so we were looking for places where we could recommend less spending in order to not be in a position where we had expended everything and more. Councillor Murphy, then Councillor LaBarge. Yeah, the placement, I mean, you, you mentioned the redesigned Pulaski Park, so I'm assuming that the clock will be one of the design elements in the new park and its pla actual placement in the park will be discussed along with the rest of the layout in, of the park in that process, correct? Um, yes. I mean, if, if, this, if this council votes to recommend funding, then as soon as, you know, your second reading is taken, then the, you know, Stimson firm becomes aware that they have this additional asset element could, to put yes, in the that could potentially be placed in the park. Okay. Council LaBarge. Um, Downey, has somebody already taken a look at that clock to say how much the cost is going to be to restore it? Yes, I believe that was done when, when the appraisal was done, it was, it was noted that it would need significant repair work. And that's why, that's why the, the um, application was for $30,000, was to take into account um, a budget of $10,000 for the repair work to the clock to make it and functional. Is it being stored right now in Holyoke? It's being, st yeah, it's being stored by the current owner. So, but again, it's being stored in conditions that have not preserved it ideally. So, which is, which is why we, you know, in looking to recommend funding, we're trying to make sure that it, if the city acquires it, that it is stored in an appropriate manner. I remember that clock because our family had a restaurant on Strong Avenue, mm -hmm. the Maple restaurant, and that clock was right there by Harry Daniels for years and years and years, and we also have pictures of it. Mm -hmm. I recall that there was some dispute as to ownership once upon a time, and that that's been settled to everyone's I've, satisfaction. I've, I've heard rumors of, of such of such disputes, but I, I believe that that uh, we we will be we will assure ourselves that that the seller has good title before. And we're fr and we will own it free and clear of any I, encumbrances. I would, I would hope that the city solicitor, if necessary, gives us assurances that okay. we would own it. Thank you. Any other questions or discussion on this? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Lavard. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Chair. Yes. And now we're up to the point where I, I, I figure by process of elimination is the one that you accuse yourself, and this is, of course, I would suspect why everyone's sitting here. Um, this is upon the recommendation of Community Preservation Committee ordered that whereas Valley Community Development Corporation submitted an application for the Community Preservation Act funding for the Northampton Lumberyard Affordable Housing Project, and whereas the project will provide approximately 54 units of affordable rental housing, uh, the units will be a mix of one, two, and three bedroom apartments entirely restricted to households earning 60 percent or less of the area median income, and whereas suitable affordable housing is, hous is a housing type that is in demand locally and regionally, and whereas the regional community development corporate, uh, the Valley Community Development Corporation has an excellent record of creating affordable housing, and whereas the value, if Valley Community Development shall hold at least one public meeting advertised at least 15 days in advance, in addition to required city hearings to receive public input on the design of the project. And whereas on December 3rd, 2014, the Northampton Community Preservation Committee voted unanimously to recommend that $300,000 in Community Preservation Act funds be used to support this project. Now, therefore, be it ordered that $300,000 be appropriated from the Community Preservation Act funding to Valley Community Development Corporation for the Lumberyard Affordable Housing Project for creation of 60 affordable housing units, and that the grantee meets the conditions approved by the Community Preservation Committee of the Mayor and the City Council. Specifically, $159,000 is appropriated from the CPA Affordable Housing Reserve account and $141,000 is appropriated from the CPA Budget Reserve. Um, does anyone have any comments? It's motion to put on the floor? Second. Seconded. Any comments before? Uh, uh, okay, Councilor, Councilor Carney, Councilor Adams, Councilor Spector. Okay, um, well, for several reasons, I'm uh, not prepared to support this first reading uh, this evening. Um, I just heard strong opposition voiced. I've been following this in paper about the butters. Um, 
uh, some, several of which spoke this evening. And I would imagine that a project of this scale um, would really, there should be some support, some significant support of the surrounding community and, the, and at least a critical mass of some neighboring abutters. And I'm not hearing that. The other concern that I have is um, I know that um, central business architecture has not given site, I, I contrast this to the one we, we passed earlier that did get site plan approval and special permit from the um, Central Business Architecture Committee. I did place a call to the chair of that committee, uh, Bruce Kravitsky, who told me he's not even at, at liberty to speak with me about that at this point. So uh, it seems premature for us to, to, to vote on this at first reading when I can't even speak to the chair of the committee to understand better the objections that that committee has of this proposal. Um, from what I understand, the, uh, open the public hearing is still open in, in central business architecture, which is why they can't um, speak about it right now. And the, one of the conditions of your committee, the CPC, was that there be a community meeting, which is now slated to be uh, next week. And, and I heard some um, concerns that that's kind of right at the height of holiday time and you know, not likely to probably pull in the, uh, the uh, critical mass of community members that would give the at least um, opportunity for a strong community input. So for those couple of reasons, I'm inclined to either uh, just vote against the proposal in first reading, or my preference would be to actually look at a way to postpone this first reading to something that at a time at which we would at least have heard back from that community meeting and heard back from central business architecture about whether they've been able to uh, resolve some of the strong issues they've voiced. Councilor Adams. I agree. I hope to support this ultimately, but I think it's premature tonight for all of those reasons that Councilor Carney stated. But um, I also, also have a couple other questions. Did it, did it get unanimous support, as the order says? I, I, was, I, was, I, thought there was at least, I thought there was one member who voted against it. No, there was um, not on the not on the final vote. Hmm. Okay, there was a recusal. Okay, there was thank you. Um, also, the the parking issue. Um, it it sounds like there are more units than spots, and um, and people will have guests, of course, and not everyone's going to ride a bike. That's not realistic, and and this is this project's also very close to um, Ward three to a Ward three neighborhood that. Um, Due to zoning changes, might experience a, a larger volume of, volume of units, and I, I wonder if it was considered that overflow parking could be in those residential neighborhoods in Ward Three. Um, and so, I'm wondering, there's no one here from planning, correct? Um, there's no one here from planning, but Devin Bruce is on the planning board, and she actually um, did, you know, did bring that up as as one of um, one of the things that came to her. She thought about the project. Um, in evaluating this, we know, we know, I mean, first, it is a large project, so there's no doubt that it's going to have an impact on the downtown. Um, on the other hand, it's, you've just voted to recommend another project that actually won't be new community housing. It will be 48 replacement units and 24 market rate for a building that is now 52. So um, that's largely going to be a replacement with some expansion. So this is really the new project. Um, there's no doubt we heard concerns um, at some of our public comment periods about the mass of the project. Um, it, you know, it is going to be approximately 54 units of community housing. Um, what we <coughs> wanted to do was to make sure that the developer met with the residents. In fact, the reason the hearing was continued was that they were aware that the meeting that we had mandated would happen on the 29th. So they didn't want to close their meeting prior to seeing what happened at that meeting. So that's, so I don't know that you can read that continuance as being, I don't think, I don't know you could read it either way as, as being based on objections or being based on approval. I just think that they thought that because they wanted to give this meeting some weight and some, you know, credibility as being a, a valuable interchange between the, the abutters and the neighborhood and the developer, um, they wanted to make their, you know, make their, take their time before they made that decision allowed to go forward. Um, but it is, it is true that the architectural committee told the CPC to go back and review the, the plans, correct? 
or not the CPC, the, uh, the Z CDC. The CDC, thank you. Yes, I mean, I think, again, any, I think, I, I don't know that there's any large project that doesn't get input. I mean, that's, the committee is not there as a rubber stamp. It's but, but, what I'm, but, but, but my point is, it, it wouldn't, is it premature then to be at this point when that hasn't, when that hasn't occurred yet? Again, from our perspective, we, you know, we knew that this would be a project with impact. Um, and so we as a committee, in recommending to you, felt that we could either try to stand in the shoes of Central Business Architecture Planning um, Conservation Commission, which will have to consider this when they deal with the relocation of that, um, of that stormwater infrastructure underneath the building. But rather than do that, we decided to recommend it and basically with the confidence that those organs of the city government will have the opportunity to make a considered decision with, with community input, which is what they're designed to do on any project. Could, would you be willing to forward the minutes of the CPC that yes. when this was discussed, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, Councilor Speck. Yeah, I essentially was going to ask similar questions, and, and one was, I'm glad the minutes will be forwarded was if you could summarize what some of the arguments were that you heard and how the committee might have addressed those. And did you, first question I should be, did you hear some of the same concerns raised besides the parking issue that, was, that were raised earlier tonight? And was that a major discussion that you guys had when you were leading up to the vote? Um, I, I would say that, that the, parking, the, parking was, the parking issue was noted by the member of the committee with the greatest expertise. Um, however, in her, in her evaluation, she noted that the parking situation downtown is something that's undergoing study right now and that to put it on the shoulders of this building, to you know, basically make this building the place where all of those concerns fall. I mean, this building is meeting the current zoning for parking. So if, you know, if that was the decision, of the city's government than to, uh, you know, basically to say, well, this is the project that we're going to make them, you know, make those regulations um, or admit that those regulations might not be what are ideal. Um, so it was noted. I think that um, the committee in moving this forward um, were recognizing that, again, the building is taller, um, but it's not as tall as would be permitted by a private developer, which would be 70 feet, um, and that it would, you know, you're going to have more residents there. That there's a balance. One is that you're going to have residents there. You're going to have people who are going to patronize businesses downtown. You're going to have people who are going to add life to the city downtown. And also, most importantly, and I think this is what we came back to, you're going to provide affordable housing for people in Northampton. And that's something that we don't have enough of. And we saw this as an opportunity to try to move this project forward. The, these design concerns may even be valid, very valid concerns, but what we want to do is move this project forward. We're going to approve the funding and that we trust that these concerns will be brought up at a later time and that perhaps there'll be changes to the design or perhaps there won't, but they'll be heard through. Is that, am I that, reading uh, that yes, correctly? Yes, that's absolutely. Council of Barge and then Council O'Donnell. Yes. I have to agree with what I'm hearing from Council Adams and Councilor Carney. I, I just feel this is just very premature. I've also talked with a couple of residents from Ward 3 who had called me of great concerns that apparently there was one meeting, I think, at the Chamber of Commerce in their hearing room, and only like a couple of people had attended that. And then there was another meeting, and um, like, maybe 20 people arrived on that one but now I also was told that they had received in the mail of a meeting that's occurring I think it's December 29th and we're doing a first voting tonight and this meeting has not been held and that's not by the city apparently it's by Valley CDC and the architects that are coming in to talk with them I wish this was done before the first meeting. I also feel that I don't want to be voting on something that I feel that I'm pushing through because I am for affordable housing. There's no question about it. I have concerns about the parking. 
I have a lot of issues here, the size of the building, coming into Northampton and seeing this massive project. Um, I, I just can't support this right now. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Thank you. I hope that um, if we entertain delaying this tonight, we don't do it because of issues such as parking. The fact that we don't have uh, parking requirements in central business is something that we've decided as a city, um, in part because we don't want to create an incentive to build parking lots everywhere downtown. And so if we're going to make this argument, it needs to be part of a bigger discussion. And I think the point was, was well made. I can't remember, I think, well, I can't remember who made it, maybe it was you, um, about uh, the parking study that's going on. Uh, and so I hope that, that we, down. okay. Um, and I hope that um, you know, that wouldn't be our reason. I wouldn't want to, to, tr to say we're going to put this on the back burner, but actually throw it on a bonfire. Um, mm. I, I want this project to move forward. I think it's, it's appropriate to ask questions about it. Um, but I think the, ma the main point was already made also that, um, well, the main question I think about this is when you appropriate the money um, or recommend the appropriation of the money, um, are you thinking about these design questions? Or, in fact, is there a process that these projects then go through um, as, as we know that there will be? Um, and finally, um, you know, my concern about a delay w would be that the funding mechanism for these things are very complex and it's, um, like, it's almost like they're set up like dominoes. And I wouldn't want to delay it and um, in so doing uh, wreck the chances for the other funding which is contingent upon this. So I'd want to know what that funding situation is. I don't know if you if, if you know how to explain that, the um, leveraged money, so to speak. Well, the, um, the one-stop application is due in, this is. Join Campbell's here. It's so the pre So, so um, the application to, for the money that this money would leverage would happen in February. So again, I, you know, this is different. We do not abdicate our responsibility to holistically evaluate project applications. Again, we don't want to try to substitute our expertise for that of the other city bodies that are going to evaluate something. We, we do, though, have representatives. I'm the representative from the Conservation Commission, so I could, for instance, give some insight as to what kind of hurdles a project might have as it goes forward through Wetlands Protection Act and local ordinance approval. Um, Devin Bruce is there from Planning Commission. David Drake is there from Historical Commission. Um, so we, do, you know, and again, this is, um, there, there may be um, an additional level of scrutiny because this is the allocation or this is voting on public money. Um, so I, I don't think there would be a problem if, you know, if this committee, again, wants to see that process play out. Um, but again, uh, as Councilor O'Donnell, I hope that the delay um, does not, I hope that because this project, um, as it goes through, it will probably be modified or it will receive input as all projects do. I don't hope, you know, I hope that's not held to a standard that's higher than any other project. Mm -hmm. I hope that, you know, if the process plays out, and again, um, we had a meeting that was specifically, we had a meeting where the applicant presented the project. Um, we had a meeting where public comment was solicited for all of our projects. And actually, one of the, I believe that one of the, the uh, citizens who spoke tonight spoke at two of our meetings. Um, and then, in addition, we mandated that another meeting be held. I mean, again, I think that it's, um, in this city, I think we do a fair job of soliciting public input. And I think that now you'll have not only the Planning Commission, but also Central Business Architecture. But, you know, I would be comfortable as chair of the commission. I think my committee would, um, with having this council, um, watch the process play out. And, you know, if at your next meeting it has site plan approval, mm -hmm. special permit, that you would be more satisfied. And again, you could also attend the meeting on the 29th to see exactly what happens there um, or you know have someone report back to you um, well as a point of information um, there, this could break a couple of ways um, that might would accommodate those concerns uh, the uh, we could vote first reading tonight and of course the next meeting our only meeting our singular meeting is January 15th um, and uh, it, such time the meeting will have transpired we'll have heard um, from uh, the architectural review and we I'm sorry. Will we have heard from them? Well, I would assume at least based and if we don't, then we don't. You don't have to vote in second reading if you want to postpone that. The the fact that that uh, 
you know, what Downey is suggesting, and, and I think he's right, is that they're holding fire until they, till the public meeting is, has addressed some of the questions that have come up. But the fact is, that, or you could not vote on it tonight and do and consider two readings on the 15th. Um, you can table it indefinitely. You can reject it. Those are, I think, those are the that's the panoply of options that before you, Councilor Adams, you were up next. Oh, um, I noticed that uh, CBC member Morin's here. Uh, do you want to speak? Um, if so, I'd recognize you. Well, I was just wondering if you want to speak. If so, I'd make a motion to recognize you. Did you at some point, or are you just here? Thank you. I had to excuse myself. Okay, that's fine. Um, no, that, that's all I wanted. Thank you. Uh, Council Shara. Um, I just want to point out one thing about this project that I think, uh, or at least underline about this project that I think makes it particularly um, important and valuable, which is that it's it's um, one, two, and three bedroom affordable housing right downtown. Mm. So this is a project that um, will be for families, and we, we very much need affordable housing for families. Uh, well, Councilor Cl well, Councilor Klein has not spoken yet, and you had your hand up. Yeah. You didn't want to. No. Do you want to speak? Yeah. You got it. First of all, I appreciate that you clarified the procedural steps because I think that was a big question for me. So thank you. Um, and just I wanted to say something, Downey. I think that um, you talked about soliciting uh, input, and I think it's really important, of course, to solicit input, but we also have to be able to respond to it. And I'm just concerned that with the turnaround time that we have here, we don't have enough time to actually address some of the issues that are being brought up by both the central business architects and, and the residents, the abutters. Um, I understand from the most recent um, hearing, the re most recent meeting, that um, somebody from the central, central business, business architecture committee talked about the design uh, being problematic, and not fitting into the neighborhood. And so we know we don't have an official report, but we have heard from those meetings that there was some pushback about the design. I believe the design firm said that they were going to go back and recalibrate, retool. Um, but I think for us to go ahead, I mean, I, I think this is an absolutely valuable project, and I want to support it wholeheartedly, but I can't support it wholeheartedly until we actually figure out how we're addressing the concerns of both the butters. Um, uh, parking doesn't worry me so much because I think learning a lot about livable communities, I think that it's really okay to create uh, buildings downtown that don't have parking spaces for every single person. I'm not so concerned about that, but I am concerned about the design pieces um, and, and just feel like we need time to be able to address those. I am concerned, though, I think that uh, someone brought up this question. I think Councillor O'Donnell brought up this question about the, the domino effect of the you know, what, uh, what's dependent on what to get the actual funding, um, it would be really helpful if we could have some sort of chart or some sense of what, in fact, is dependent on our making this decision about the CPC funding um, so that we know what we might be holding up or if we're foiling some really um, important funding. You, I think you, we need to know that. The executive director of Valley CDC is here if you want to recognize her and yes. ask her those questions. Second. Second. And the motion's been made and uh, seconded to recognize Joanne Campbell of Valley CDC. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Joanne, you want to come up and answer some of these questions? <coughs> sure. Aye. Aye. Uh, so the uh, CBAC and Site Plan uh, Planning Board has been continued to January 8th. So we have heard about the design issues and we've been working on them this past week. So we are going to be submitting uh, revised drawings to the CBAC. Um, for site plan, we did not hear, from the planning board, we did not hear really any really pertinent issues. Uh, we meet all the zoning requirements. There is no parking required in Central Business District. We have proposed 41 parking spaces, so we're above what's required. We're at 45 feet. Uh, the height limit is 70. The minimum is 30. Um, so we are dealing with the design, so that certainly we heard a lot of criticism, and we have heard loud and clear, and we are making those changes. So. Um, and we are, because the CPC had put in the recommendation um, to you around the notice to have a meeting with a 15-day notice, we wanted to get that, I know the timing is, doesn't look good, but in order to get 
a meeting before the January 8th meeting, so it didn't look like we were just having a meeting after January 8th when the board was going to meet again, mm -hmm. we pl and we planned it for December 29th, and I should say I will answer emails, I will take phone calls, I will meet with people, so if the 29th doesn't work, um, so we are going back January 8th um, to the planning, to a joint planning board uh, CBAC hearing, and so you will have, you will know, uh, at least that following morning, where the planning board and the CBAC stands. And um, could, could you speak to the point that Councilor Klein was asking about? Was what is what does this money leverage? What are deadlines that you have pending and looming? So that it's we, with the new governor coming in, we don't have an exact date yet, but we've been told February is the pre-application where we would, uh, in order to be able to submit there, we need all our funding commitments other than the state funding commitment. So anything local, um, including CPC, would need to be committed by that date. We also need site plan approval uh, and CBAC approval for that process as well. Is that February 1? There's, we don't have a date yet, so they I would just say it's mid-February, I mean, just because the governor's not coming in until Okay. And Councilor Klein, this you still have the floor. Do you? Mm -hmm. Okay, Councilor Carney, you. Thank you, thanks, Joanne. And I'm I'm sure that, well, I don't know if there's anyone who's been a stronger advocate for affordable housing on this board than I have. I've served on the Housing Partnership, I served on the Housing Authority, and I know that we d desperately do need affordable housing, and especially downtown. I know that. Um, I, I do agree with the principle that will provide uh, an opportunity for access to city services and especially um, single, s small, one-bedroom units in addition to family housing that Councilor Shearer brought up. A project of this scale, though, I do think really needs to have uh, um, a, large, a large level of support from the, from the abutters and from the wider community. And I'm just really hoping that whatever whatever uh, modifications or changes or ways to bring in, to buy in from the neighbors can be attained before that date uh, because I think it is such a large scale project that it would, it would not feel successful to me if it were one that went forward with such strong objection. So I'm hoping that that can happen in the time frame and I would be looking more towards a postponement int until after those meetings that you re uh, referenced. Uh, Council Labar, yeah, um, and then Council Adams. When December 29th, where? Um, at the Educational Collaborative, previously HEC, 97 Holly Street. Thank you. Council Adams? At 6 o'clock. Move to postpone to January 15th. Second. The discussion is, the, the motion is to postpone this decision till the, the our meeting on the 15th. Uh, on, the, on the motion, Councilor yeah. O'Donnell. I just think that if we postpone, uh, it would be appropriate for us to, to be prepared to take two votes on that date if we're going to meet certain funding deadlines. Yes. Uh, it sounds uh, like. Uh, it sounds uh, like. Uh, wait, wait, wait until be recognized, please. Uh, Councilor Adams. Sounds like mid February is the, is, the, is the deadline we have to worry about here. So we could certainly do two votes on January 15th, but it, that might not even be necessary. Councilor Spector. Um, it does concern me a little bit too with a new governor coming in you say we don't know the deadline I would hate to suddenly have it be February 1st there's an, right. you know maybe there's so I would certainly be one who would only support this even though I seconded it if we have a, a sense of the council that we would be willing to do two votes by that time we may know that it won't be till mid-February but if we don't have it I don't see why we would risk that a uh, whole project, you know, and all of this funding. So I would certainly support that as well and would want the sense of the council. Council LaBarge. Did you have your hand up? Yep. I, I support what um, Councilor Spector is saying. I don't have a problem doing two votes. Councilor Adams. If, if, the, if they came back and said they need us to do two votes that night, absolutely. I'd support it. Councilor Khan. And likewise, I would imagine that by January 15th, when we take this first reading, we'll know whether or not an application is due in two weeks or in four weeks. I would hope that oh, by the then we'll be What's the right. What's inauguration date in there? That's going to be in January. The January. Eight. Eight. Yeah. Uh, all right. This is on the motions. Any further discussion on the motion for postponement? 
All those in favor, roll please say aye. Roll oh, we roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. <clears throat> Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. No. <clears throat> Councilor Klein. Yes. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. yes. Councilor Murphy. I abstain. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. No. Councilor Spector. Yes. Uh, the motion carries, I believe. So the did it carry? The motion is to postpone, and the motion carries. Okay. So yeah. Yeah. So that will be postponed through the January fifteenth meeting. Uh, Downey. If I can have on my list of things to do to forward the minutes of the meeting, but if there are any additional documents that you so. have, as you can see. Um, of course, I'm sure you'll be more interested in what site plan is. Thank you. Thank you so much for your Thank time. You. I appreciate that. And uh, just, just one more point. If we could just have a, a notification, Joanne, about that meet community meeting, just an email sent out. I don't know that, that I received anything, but if there's something that says that, I know you, I heard you say it, that'd be helpful. Just, just to Pamela, send, I think. Send it to Pam Power, Pamela Powers at NorthamptonMob.gov. Thank you. Speed powers. Um, also, speaking of Pam, she smacked me in the back of the head to point out that we didn't address the financial order that was at the top, which is the only thing that practically that yeah, it's the only order that actually came out of finance. So it's the this is the order regarding James House. Um, oh. But, yeah, so I would accept the motion. Put, uh, there's a <coughs> motion to put on the floor and seconded. Any further discussion on the James House, the authorization of uh, for James House? Stop it. Stop Council it. Specter? Yes, sir. Hi. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. <laughs> All right. Good. That, nice of you uh, to join just, us. Just to uh, reiterate what I said earlier, that I think this is a great project and we're doing a fantastic work over there and we need to support it. Uh, Council LaBarge. I agree with this. I said it before through finance. This is an excellent um, project that's going on there, and it allows us to preserve the James House, and it's also generating money for us to keep up with the maintenance and so forth. And just for the record, I'd like to point out there is a massive daycare center right next door in the budding system at the People's Institute. And there may actually, and since they sold the property, there are actually, I believe, there's a covenant restricting daycare activities at the James House. You may want to investigate. Ed Etheridge drafted the covenants. Um, <laughs> just a heads up. Okay. Roll call. Roll call, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labard. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Recess. You want to recess? I mean, are we th sure. Are you with Sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, I, you know what? I would like to bump Middle Street up before oh. we do that. Okay. Can yeah. we do that? Yep. Because yeah. 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 we've been waiting six okay. years. <laughs> <laughs> right in that, in that chair. We also have a, there's another person waiting for something else, too. So. Well, let's, let's oh, really? cover we're those. Two. For what? Okay. I'll just make a quick comment. Got it. Uh, for the licensing, uh, six-minute break has been requested, and we're going to grant that right now, just so that everyone's attention is focused on on the issues at hand, as opposed to the other pressing issues. So now it's six years and six minutes. We're in recess. We're coming, we're coming out of recess, a raucous recess, and we're going to move up in the order uh, on the agenda. The uh, Item 14.321, which is the uh, limited time parking on Middle Street. If there are no objections, we'll move that up. Okay. Uh, I'll accept a motion to put that on the floor. This is, before, uh, as you understand, it's a Schedule 3 limited time parking on Middle Street in Florence. And it comes with a positive recommendation on uh, uh, from ordinance and, and from the Finance Committee. I looked at the wrong one. TPC. That's right, TPC. TPC. Yep. And, and. Okay. So, uh, a motion? Make a motion. Second. Okay. Council Murphy, 
I don't know. I mean, we're all pretty well acclimated to this issue. This. <laughs> um, I did contact the building owners again and give them my letter and indicate that kind of due to a technicality had been postponed for another week. And if they were compelled to come and speak their piece, they should come tonight. And I don't see them here. And I, again, I think some of that is um, that the mix of tenants in the building has changed a little bit, making it easier to give up the three spaces at the end of Middle Street for uninhibited parking and the fact that it's not so bad in the building anymore. So what, what's on the table now I think will solve the problem for the owners and uh, of the houses on Middle Street and work for, for the building people as well since they've been told twice this is happening, it's been noticed in the paper and they're not here. The one thing I would ask is we get two readings tonight because we're not meeting to the 15th and one of the complications of this is snow. And while we've been lucky so far, I'm sure by the 15th there will be snow. So it would be nice to post it so that when the plowing occurs, it's already posted. So, uh, And just I'll also note, and it has been brought up before, that this would make this consistent with other streets in the vicinity of Middle Street that have that same parking. So another reason to support it at this point. Councilors, any, any other discussion? Okay. Uh, what's your preference on? Do you want to roll call on this one? Or? It's ordinance. Better. Yeah. Councilor? Yeah. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labarge? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Councilor Scherer? Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Uh, Councilor Murphy? Move to suspend rules for a second reading. Second. Motions are made. And seconded to suspend rules to allow for a second reading. Any discussion on this on the motion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Move opposed? second reading. Second. <clears throat> the motion's made and seconded for second reading. Any further discussion? Okay. Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sherry. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. It is done. Nora can go home to your children. Nora, you may go home to your children. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you for your inexhaustible patience. So. <laughs> it's also been a recommendation, a suggestion to bring up uh, in the order um, the uh, motion to uh, expand the li the the license for the city um, is there any is any any objections to that no okay we're okay with that do we lose council Carney for okay um, where is it in the order here it's the very last one no. We have a long agenda. It's, a, it's an actually an order. It's it a, is an order for but a bit of Forbes Library. <laughs> special legislation number 14, 3.46, yes. the order regarding special legislation. Sorry. Yeah, um, do you have a copy of it that I can read? Uh, which one are we on? Okay. This is, we're going to move up in the order, the order regarding special legislation. Um, so this is ordered that the city of Northampton has a vibrant downtown with unmatched entertainment, restaurant, and retail offerings. And whereas the city of Northampton is over quota for all alcohol license established in section 17 of chapter 138 of the Massachusetts General Laws, and whereas in September 2014 the Northampton License Commission solicited applications for all alcohol license that became available following the revocation and six existing Northampton restaurants applied. And whereas Healthy Karma L uh, LLC doing business as Hinge, Rias Baixas, was I even close? <laughs> okay. Uh, LLC uh, doing business as I uh, Ibiza Tapas, uh, Local Burger LLC doing business as Local Burger. OBCT Incorporated doing business as Sierra Grill and Sylvester's Fine Food Incorporated doing businesses 
as uh, Sylvester's Restaurant were qualified, but not selected in the final random lottery drawing for the license. And whereas the inability to serve all alcohol beverages hinders these five existing restaurants from expanding offerings and bringing additional patrons and revenue to Northampton, and whereas earlier this year Governor Patrick proposed economic development legislation eliminating the Commonwealth's outdated liquor license quota to system to give cities and towns local control over the process, and whereas this much-needed reform was included in a version of that bill adopted by the Senate, was not included in a House version, and was ultimately not part of the final economic development bill signed into law. And whereas special legislation remains the only means for allowing the city of Northampton to issue over quota annual all alcohol restaurant li uh, liquor licenses to strengthen and enhance the economic vitality of our downtown and community, now therefore be it ordered that the mayor is authorized and directed to seek special legislation as follows. An act authorizing the city of Northampton to issue five above quota annual all alcohol restaurant licenses to the following businesses, and I've already named them, and we'll spare you that reading them again. Uh, and uh, be it enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives in general court assembled and by the authority of the same as follows. Section 1, notwithstanding Section 17 of Chapter 138 of the, of the general laws, in addition to any authorized by existing special legislation, the licensing authority of the City of Northampton may issue above quota annual all alcohol licenses to the above named enterprises. Uh, and do, do the licenses authorized hereunder shall be subject to all the provisions of said Chapter 138, except Section 17, upon revocation of any license authorized hereunder or upon the cessation of business of the licensee or the failure of the licensee to exercise the license for six consecutive months, the license shall, after hearing, revert to the city for reissuance to another licensee. Motions are made second. and seconded. Uh, Your Honor. Well, I, <clears throat> I tried to make the resolution sort of self, uh, self descriptive, but um, you sort of have the gist of it. Um, uh, obviously, this is, continues to be an issue. Um, I, I came before the council uh, at the end of last year um, to seek a special legislation to secure a hotel um, alcohol license for the new Hilton, uh, not Hilton, Fairfield Inn on Con Street. Uh, and that finally was secured, uh, luckily, in time for the opening of the hotel. And this, you know, this remains the system that we have to follow if we want to secure additional licenses. Um, I was very supportive, uh, submitted testimony in favor of the governor's proposal to do away with the quota system. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, that didn't carry the day. Um, and so I, I believe that uh, the process that was held, there was this one convertible license that was uh, made available, having been revoked from a license holder. And uh, of the folks who applied, there were six uh, restaurants, all of whom the license, these are all six existing restaurants. They currently have um, an alcohol license. They don't have an all alcohol license, but they have, uh, they have beer and wine license. Um, and the, the license commission deemed them all uh, as potentially suitable to receive the license and actually use the random lottery system as sort of the fairest way to, uh, to choose which one would get it. Um, at the end of that process, I have had conversations with several of the, of the um, non-winning uh, applicants, and uh, they've uh, you know, expressed frustration with this system that we have, the quota system, and uh, the fact that Northampton is this uh, vibrant a city that has a lot of restaurants and, um, and the ability to be able to serve all types of alcohol enhances their business. So that's why I'm bringing this forward. I still want to push for this larger issue. And I know um, we had a meeting, uh, the mayor's had a meeting with Governor, uh, Governor-elect Baker, and this was one of the issues we talked about because this is strongly supported by mayors and cities and towns. So I don't know where he is on this issue. Um, but. Uh, but in the meantime, I have also talked to Peter Cocott. He's um, waiting for this, and we'll submit it on January 16th, which is when the the session, the deadline for legislators to submit legislation for the beginning of the session. So I'll uh, answer any questions that people have. Any questions? Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. 
I'm just curious about the format. Um, you're required to list the actual businesses in the legislation. We are because in this case, um, uh, uh, we um, you know that the uh, yeah we are we in, and we've done this in the past. We um, actually the license that was revoked and and raffled off uh, was um, was one of five special act licenses that were created for. Although typically we've. Um, we, we uh, haven't gone and said just give us a bunch of licenses, although interestingly, um, it, while that economic development bill failed, um, there was tucked into that bill um, a uh, provision giving Boston 23 licenses, um, additional licenses. Uh, and I know that Holyoke recently, as an economic development tool, requested 13 uh, licenses. They don't actually have the restaurants for them, but their goal is to, if they think if they have the licenses, they can attract restaurants. But in this case, we, we, um, we wanted to be clear that these were licenses for these specific establishments. So you, you wouldn't explore having, the, having them named in, in the whereas section, but in the actual law, say, you know, uh, two, five duly licensed restaurants in Northampton. Yeah, this was drafted by the city solicitor. and. Um, and we just wanted there to be no, what I didn't, what I wanted to be clear was that these were the, f these were the five establishments that I wanted these uh, licenses to be given to. I didn't want there to be any doubt about that. Um, uh, so that's, and, and this is the language we use. It's the language we used for the, um, for the Fairfield Inn, and it's the language we used in a previous iteration where we, I think we got, um, the fairgrounds and I think uh, the golf uh, country club. There are, there are a series of other licenses we got over quota. Yeah. If anything, it just it shows how broken the, the licensing system is in the artificial cap. It the is, and it's. We have to go and put the actual yeah. names of businesses into, into the law yeah. uh, to get a special exemption, I think. It's, yeah. It that yeah, and, I, and again, it's, uh, it's sort of, you know. Uh, Having to go on bended knee to uh, Boston, and uh, and you're sort of at the whim of that process. Um, you know, I, I want you know Representative Cocott and Senator Rosenberg are very good about trying to shepherd these through, but you never know what you're going to encounter. Um, most of these are done in in uh, informal session and they're passed, but it only takes one member often to object, and so you can these things can get tied up in other political issues so it just it doesn't if you're a business owner if you're you know if you're making a multi-million dollar investment in a hotel um, and you have to figure out like am I going to get a license or am I not going to get a license it yeah so it just doesn't make a lot of sense um, and the and you know the population base um, you know that's the system that these quotas are on you know not every city of 30,000 has what we have here in Northampton, you know, has this uh, concentration of, uh, of, of establishments. So the one size fits all really doesn't work. So, Councilor Klein? I just have a question about um, what does this mean as we move forward? If more restaurants come forward and say, I want a license as well, do we, on a regular basis, would we create legislation like this to, t to send to Boston? How will that work? Well, it's a good, I mean, it's happened. Uh, we, we have done it over time, um, uh, usually in, in sort of clumps like this. Um, and uh, frankly, I, I hope we don't have to do that. I hope that we, um, I hope we can see some reform at the, at the state level uh, to, to reform the system so we don't have to keep doing this. Um, and. Uh, but we'll see. We'll see what happens with the current, uh, the current governor. And um, as I said, the Senate supported it. They passed it. The House, um, uh, you know, there's some various competing interests here. I think there's um, obviously folks who have licenses um, because of the way the quota system has played out and sort of cr made them the marketable commodity that gets bought and sold. Um, there's a concern that their licenses will be devalued. There's other, you know, concerns that people may have actually collateralized these, and they're, you know, sort of toward credit on their establishments, and so there were a lot of arguments <coughs> being made that, you know, this would, banks would start calling their notes on restaurants and bars and things like that. A little, little bit of drama, I think, but, um, but that was those are some of the concerns. Um, you know, in Boston, you know, you have all these, um, you know, you had all the all the old established 
bars and restaurants, and then you have all these new areas of the city that are undergoing, um, you know, sort of a rebirth, you know, um, Jamaica Plain, Dorchester, places like that, but there's no licenses because they're all, they're all taken. So how, you know, how do you, how do they spur economic development if all the licenses are spoken for and they've got, you know, nothing to, no one, none to give out. So um, it really is an economic development bill and, you know, there is going to be this uh, company I've heard of uh, somewhere, I think MGM, that's going to be opening lots of bars, lots of restaurants uh, as part of their um, entertainment uh, destination in Springfield. So again, it's all part of this issue of how do we keep Northampton uh, strong and viable and, uh, and, and attract customers. Council LeBarge. Yes. As, as far as I can remember with our former mayor, it was brought up at one of the meetings that we had in the hearing room about the problems. And I think Councilor Bill Dwight, you were also involved with us on that. It was a big problem about restaurant owners wanting a license and we just could not do it because of the way the law was written. I have to agree with you, Mayor. I, I think we need to look at the city of Northampton and hopefully get this moving it's a dire need and I agree the so-called whatever is going to come into Springfield could be very detrimental for our city so we need to move on it I, I for one have uh, what we've seen is this is the vestigial remnants of something that came out of prohibition <laughs> part of the blue laws but then some people actually make money this way Consequently, it becomes politically a hot potato in the Boston end. Uh, the fact that you have a license that's issued by the state that is considered an asset. I have a license issued by the state. I couldn't sell it to a single soul, not legally. The fact that we actually, we've turned this into an asset and consequently you constrain communities from making their own decisions about the viability of their own economic development. Uh, is is preposterous. I mean, and and to to the point about the casino, which it came with lots of state support and state protections, and the casinos use liquor licenses as a loss leader. They're not going to make their money on liquor. They're going to make their money off the drunk people who are going to be pulling slot machines. That is our bread and butter. That is their loss leader. This is, we have local business owners invested in this community working on a narrow margin trying to capture as much as they can that's being, that will be drawn away uh, and threaten the viability of our businesses. And we are constrained from allowing them to function to the best of their capability and to enhance our community. And we should be able to determine ourselves what is appropriate and inappropriate not based on a, on this arbitrary quota of population um, so uh, <laughs> I'm not gonna have a problem voting for this it makes me it makes me apoplectic this has driven me crazy for well <laughs> since I became conscious of alcohol so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, did you have something you wanted to add to that the only other thing that I was going to add is that um, and this actually will maybe make you a little more crazy, but there was apparently a period in the 60s or the 70s where a bunch of communities in Massachusetts got to opt out of the quota system. Um, apparently, I'm not sure where, where we were during that period. We obviously didn't, we're downtown. We're more pure today. <laughs> but Worcester, for example, has no quota. Right. Worcester is exempt from the quota. There's a handful, uh, you know, 20, a couple dozen communities that are not part of the quota system because there was this moment in time where they got to opt out. And I still haven't quite figured out was, how that. It was coincidental with lowering the drinking age to 18. OK. And um, uh, why uh, you saw bars in the middle of tobacco fields. Yeah. So, um, so not every city is subject to this. So it's another one of those oddities of the system. I support this order, and this is all very interesting, but the hour's getting late. Yeah. <laughs> Good point. Uh, <laughs> point taken. Let's have a drink. Keep it high from the bar. <laughs> yeah. it's the, last call. Uh, <laughs> last call. Uh, any, any further uh, comments or questions on this point? 
Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Now this will come up at uh, January 15th for the second reading, which is, and the subsequent day is when uh, uh, a Rep. Cocott is planning on submitting this. So. Okay, now back to the reg regular <laughs> the regular order of business. <coughs> the order to accept the donation of granite mileage markers. This is in second reading. So so approval. Move to approve. Any further discussion on this? No. Nope. Ready? Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Okay. You didn't say me. Councilor oh. Lavard. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That is passed in second reading. Uh, this is also in second reading. I believe this is the order to acquire land from Peter Bay. <clears throat> Move to approve. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? <clears throat> Roll call, please. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shara. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. That also passes in second reading. Uh, this is the order to accept the deed in lieu of foreclosure. Second reading. Move approval. Move to second it. Uh, any further discussions of the little piece of property, sliver of land? Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector? Yes. Councilor Adams? Yes. Councilor Carney? Yes. Councilor Dwight? Yes. Councilor Klein? Yes. Councilor Labar? Yes. Councilor Murphy? Yes. Councilor O'Donnell? Yes. Uh, next up is in second reading. This is the order to modify council rules to add the DPW committee. To move to approve, second it. Motion to made in second. Yes. Oh, geez. I keep doing this. I'm sorry. Well, let's vote on that one. Let's, let's vote on this since we're on it. Okay. All right. Sorry. I skipped two instead of one. I need to look up the rules for removing the council president. I'd abdicate first. Um, the. Uh, <laughs> The, so this is this is on the order to modify council rules to add the DPW committees moved and uh, seconded. Any further discussion? Is my intent to uh, name the committee members after? Should this survive the second vote? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labar. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Uh, I would like to uh, appoint, without objections, uh, Councilor Adams, Councilor Klein, and Councilor Spector to this newly formed committee. I do. Okay. <laughs> Councilor Adams. <laughs> we have 60 days to meet. You, you have, you, that's right. You have 60 days to have your first meeting. And then you guys can start to figure out your order and order of business and your officers. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so hey, uh, do you see this? This is an elevator on here. Apparently, the uh, the order for ninety nine thousand dollars for the Forbes Library elevator project is a second reading. Motion approved. Motion is made and seconded. Any further discussion? Roll call, please. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarde. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Now we come to our next controversial item. Uh, this is the uh, orders pertaining to dogs running at large uh, uh, per request of the police chief performance to Mass General Law. Uh, there's two orders. Do you there's want a, group. a group. Take as a group. Okay. The dispense dog. with the reading. And there's been a request for two readings. And dispense with the public and Dispense reading. with the reading? Please. Please. Yes. Well, okay. Um, the uh, okay. The motions are made and put on the floor. Is there a uh, discussion? Well, just that we do this every year, and it's a yes. Well, it's hang on a second. I know that the, there's some councilors who actually raise some interesting questions, okay, and so I really hope that they will raise some interesting questions on the floor. I take back my request okay. to dispense the reading. I request um, to go ahead and to read it. The reading. Do you have the hang on a second. Well, these guys have it. It's terrible. Okay. Okay. But it is true, as we get this, this is something that we, we do annually. It's uh, uh, mass general law, and it requires authorization by the council every year. Um, it, 
talk about antiquities and throwbacks, this is something that, that yeah. it's like weighers of hay and coal. Uh, we don't weigh hay or coal anymore, but we do vote on the people who are authorized to do it should it come up. And this is uh, upon the recommendation of the chief of police. This is um, uh, ordered that pursuant to the authority granted by the general laws, uh, chapter 140, section 167, all dogs in the city of Northampton shall be restrained from running at large during the period from January 1, 2015 through and including December 31st, <coughs> 2015. The owner or keeper of a dog may use such a dog for sporting purposes during hunting season provided for by the fish and game laws of the Commonwealth. And the other order is order that a warrant be issued by the City Council to the Police Department under uh, General Law uh, Chapter 140, Section 167 to catch and confine or kill all dogs within the City of Northampton that are running at large as provided in Section 167 of said Chapter 140 during the period from January 1, 2015 through and including January 31st of 2015. Um, and Council LaBarge. I recall when this came on the floor when I became a counselor and former counselor Fran Volkman and I were living with the language of this ordinance. And we were told, I think it was Nancy Graham at that time who came here to city council and I think you were a counselor then too, Councilor Carney. Oh. I was, she wasn't. Oh, oh yeah, because yeah. Fran, Fran and I and served together. being animal lovers and dog lovers, there was great concerns about that language. And it was explained to us the language is there because of the way that the state has it. So if an animal is at large, they don't kill Shoot it. Him. But I don't like it, never have. And I, th I, th I think it's serious language here where you could actually look at it and think a dog is going to be killed. I think the, the reason for that, because I had concerns too, the reason for that is not that the police are going to go out and sh shoot all the dogs running at large. The problem would be is if they really needed to shoot a dog After. who's running at large, who is dangerous, and shoot them, it protects them because they have the right to do that and then protects them from lawsuits. It's not that our police are going to go out and do that or a dog is rabbits, but it's giving that overall protection to do that. I think if any policeman went out and shot a dog who was just running at large, I think that would create quite a ruckus in this town. And, uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Just briefly, I, I wonder if it's not worth looking at um, to see if, if this is actually provided for in some other part of, of Mass General Law or something we can put into an ordinance so we don't do this year after year. I mean, maybe it is. If so. we've just been doing it automatically and because we've just been wanting to dispense with it quickly, maybe we've been doing it for decades, but maybe it's changed. I, I feel like I've seen it in, uh, codified in other cities and towns. I, th I think I asked that when Mayor Higgins was, was you yeah. did. mayor, and I think she said we can't for some I would support a revisit of that if Councillor O'Donnell wanted to. Um, well, <laughs> happy to uh, save the dog. Just signed up for that. Yeah. Uh, uh, the. It's actually, as I said, it's, it's a bit of an antiquity. It goes back to um, when the farms dominated the area and dogs were, there were no leash laws, and dogs would pack up and um, start running down uh, farm animals. And then there were also feral dogs, which we don't see at all, I don't think. But the fact is, is that this, this is kind of a remnant of that like our liquor laws and like town crier a town crier we don't have a town crier we eliminated the town crier that was a co another controversy for another day but so that said um i don't know if i answered some of the questions that some of the counselors yes, had about you. this issue but uh and i don't know how they prepared to vote is there any other further any other discussion on this item i know that the people in the community were asking the same thing mm -hmm. so it's pretty scary when you hear it it's yeah. and particularly if you run as a counselor at large it's <laughs> some really horrible visitation so um uh no further discussion there's a request for two readings um, that's because this is the final meeting of the year okay. so yeah. that that's what the reason for the two readings <laughs> I, 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 it, given the dates as defined because of the dates yeah, yeah. Um, 
I would assume. I haven't actually. Those doggies would have two weeks. Because of they want to have the authority come January 1st, and otherwise they won't It'll be get two it weeks until the 15th. Not being protected here in the community. <laughs> so <laughs> two weeks under protected. <laughs> well, let's take the first vote. All right. Uh, the, uh, the motion has the motion been made? I, I'm sorry. It was, it was yes. or it was okay. Uh, no further discussion. Okay. Roll call on the first vote, please. Councilor Carney. Yes. Mr. Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. It's Bark. Yes. <laughs> Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Sarah. Yes. Councilor Spector. <laughs> yes. Suspense. Councilor Rado. Yes. Second. Okay. <laughs> it passes in first reading. The motion's been made already and seconded. For to suspend rules. All those in favor of suspending rules, please aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. Uh, Move I'll in second reading. Second. Motions are made in second for second reading. No further discussion. Roll call, please. Councilor uh, Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Yes. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. <laughs> I'd just like to say that I'm glad it's 10 o'clock that my 13-year-old dog already went to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I can't Does your dog watch the meeting? Has <laughs> um, she been bad or something? She has <laughs> she been bad? <laughs> All right, next up is, um, this is relative to the city council salary. I'll read the order first and explain that. This is the benefits? Uh, yes, this is actually we'll do benefits first, and that's what's up. And of course, we're after dogs. Um, and I should point out that there's been a question. Uh, Councilor Adams raised a question, and it's and it's a good question: is uh, why are we voting on something that we stand to benefit from, uh, which is always a bit of a problem. Isn't that the rule so of necessity? Point of fact, actually, well, we don't need to invoke the rule of necessity because this does not will not go into effect until the next municipal election. So we have no assurance that any one of us are going to be here in this benefit. So you're voting on the position. This is established under the language of the charter. It will come up that the mayoral salary that we're voting on also becomes effective at the next municipal election, but, court, but that will not include the mayor. I see. And there has been an opinion that's been solicited. The city solicitor has um, given us an opinion that I forwarded to you all that the mayor um, will not sign it. And since the mayor does not sign it, it, it goes into effect if it passes here after 10 days. It's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and they've checked with the ethics commission that, that passes muster. But it may not satisfy people's dis discomfort on that point. But we'll get to that point when we get to it. So this is first up. This is upon the recommendation of the mayor. This is an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing that the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be amended by revising Section 5, uh, Section B, 5-5B uh, 5 5 of said code, providing that compensation of elected officials be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton in the City assembled as follows. Section 1, that Section 5 uh, <laughs> 5-B of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton should be amended so that such section shall read as follows. Benefits and expenses. B. The Mayor, City Clerk, City Council, School Committee, and Trustees of Smith Vocational and Agricultural School, also known as Superintendents of Smith's Agricultural School, shall be eligible to enroll in the City's Municipal Health Insurance Program and Retirement Plan. I'll accept a motion. Put that on the floor. So we'll second it. Um, uh, Councilor Spector, Councilor O'Donnell, Councilor Adams. The, uh, first. It, it, this is somewhat problematic in terms of breaking this up in this way um, for me because what, and I am not running again in the next lecture, so this definitely will not affect me. And I do think that all the councilors who serve and the amount of time we put in, I think councilors do deserve more money than they currently get. It's been many, many years since this council has uh, gotten an increase in its salary. And in fact, even at the recommendation, it barely keeps up. I don't even know if it does keep up with inflation. The reason I'm saying 
to vote on this, if I vote yes for the benefit piece, what I would like to see to make it fairer across the board would be a more substantial increase that's been being recommended. I would recommend something in the range of 15 to 17,000 for a counselor. I'm just going to deal with, with that. But that there be no benefit, in which case we're bringing this up. And the reason I would say that is it would then mean that all the counselors would get the same amount of money. And that we currently have a system that's very unlike any place else where there's where you go to work, where your salary is 5000 but for those of us taking the health benefit, it's worth more than two times the amount. Now, one of the things we want to be able to do is to have working class, working class and middle class people come and serve on the council. For most of them, they already get health insurance through their work. So they don't gain anything through that benefit. Right? They don't gain anything through that benefit. So only about half of this council currently takes that benefit. So in order to make it both more attractive to people, to say, you know what, I could get $15,000. I may not have to work another part-time job. I could serve on the city council because it may pay me fifteen or 17000 It doesn't do me any good on the health insurance side. I work a 40-hour week. I get health insurance. And it doesn't... The, the folks who are currently getting health insurance, they then will be compensated. So if they want to get it, there's enough money for them to then get it. Again, the problem I would have is if we vote on this section first before I know that increase, I would not vote to eliminate the benefit if we do not give a more substantial increase in the salary. So that we, we had seen a recommendation earlier on that there was a recommendation to increase the salary, and it looked very dramatic, from 5000 to 10000 but it was taking away the health benefit. And that to me, and again, I don't even think the 10,000, given the number of years that have gone by, I don't think the 10,000 was a fair increase. It was certainly not a fair increase if you take away the health benefit. So I hope that made some sense. So I would either support keeping the health benefit with the increase in salary for everyone, though I don't think that is fair, and I, again, don't think it's fair to people who are looking at potentially running. I would rather see a more substantial increase across the board. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell, you were next, and then Councilor Adams. Um, and, and then as we go through the debate, you may want to make a recommendation on how we proceed. But Councilor O'Donnell. Thank you. Um, first thing is just an observation. Um, the way this is written, it doesn't change anything in the current law. And so in fact, if we vote on it, there is no self-interest. The only thing it really does is change the word, uh, how we describe yeah, the Smith true. Volk trustee. So it's actually not phrased in the negative, which is interesting. I agree with Councilor Spector. Uh, that does change the whole question, I think. It's, it's kind of a, so in a way, it's a monkey wrench in the whole process if you get into it in detail. Um, but it doesn't change anything, so that's one point. The second point is I think that Health care is more than part of compensation for your labor. I think it's also a policy decision as a city. I have a hard time taking health care away from anybody. Right. Oh, and full disclosure, I take the health care to the city. Um, if, I, if I wanted to make it more fair and apply more evenly, I would rather expand it to, to, to more people rather than take it away to make it more fairer. Um, but that's a, a point that I think is, is important to make because contained within our charter, which requires us to pass an ordinance to establish this advisory board is sort of it was sort of a poison pill in a way because w the advisory board is is meant and has to consider benefits and i think the fact is that we can't get a recommendation on a salary number out of that advisory board without a concurrent recommendation on benefits and the two are tethered within mm -hmm. the report. Mm -hmm. As Councillor Spector uh, alluded to, you might have just said it outright, part of the reason why the advisory board recommended increasing stipends was they were also going to eliminate some benefits. And to reiterate, I don't support removing benefits. But I think if we're going to improve, uh, um, increase stipends particularly, we need to assess it on various, on, on, on various, um, Tests, and I realize I've talked for a, while, a long time, so I'll be be brief. But 
Um, we have to make sure we're acting on clear, unambiguous recommendations from a neutral committee. And we have to make sure that we're acting in a way that somehow benefits the public interest. And I think Councillor Spector's points about will this actually, for example, allow someone to, to serve an office who isn't able to now, I think that's a legitimate question in terms of the public interest. And in terms of the clarity um, of, of the recommendation, I think we run into problems because we're not going to remove benefits, nor should we. But therefore, is the recommendation from the Compensation Advisory Board still what they would recommend if we went back to them and say, okay, give us a number, but we're going to keep the benefits? I think that's a difficulty here. That's right. So this, this committee uh, did recommend removing the option of, of health care, um, health, city health insurance for, for certain part-time elected officials. Um, and, and, and the ordinance leaves it the way it is, which allows the, the option of it. And I was perplexed that this was their recommendation. And the reason why is because they based, um, they, they paid great attention and based their recommendations in large part to what other communities are doing. They've, they compared us to, uh, for example, they, they, one, of their, one of the things they compared us to was this eight surrounding cities benchmark. And, and that's eight um, similar cities. And every city, um, in that eight surrounding cities benchmark, except for one, one outlier, um, one outlier provided health for health insurance. Every single one except for one, that, that's 89%. And, um, and, and, and the average salary, I know Sorry. we'll get to that, but I'll just throw in, is, uh, uh, about, is, is more than $2,500 more. And they offered the, the health insurance benefit. They, they looked at another benchmark. It was a surrounding 23 cities benchmark. 17 out of 23. Um, allowed for health insurance. That's 74 percent. So there's no trend towards removing part-time elected officials off municipal health insurance. There's just no trend towards that. So that's what part of the reason why I was perplexed. Um, so it's inconsistent with what other communities are doing that they compared us to repeatedly for the mayor's salary, for the, for, for the clerk's salary, and, and, and otherwise throughout the study, but here they diverged. Um, and so it's not only uncommon, I, I, I believe that it's unfair. It's, it's fair because everyone has the option. One of the things the report said is that it's not fair that some take it and others don't. But it's very fair because every person has the option equally. And they can take it or not as they choose. Mm -hmm. um, the average health plan, a health insurance plan, in my research showed is about $8,000 a year. Um, if the, these raises propose that counselors will get $9,000, a ward counselor, and $9,500 for an at-large counselor. After health insurance is deducted for those who take the option, there's about, they get about $1,000. Yeah, it was the committee, the committee said it was not their intention to reduce the overall benefits. Well, that, that's exactly what they would, they would do with this recommendation. Um, and some of the reasons given for increasing the mayor's and clerk's pay is that we need to continually co attract competent quality candidates, and I agree with that. But the same goes for, for council candidates. And, and I think this point was pointed out in other ways, but if you reduce a major benefit, you're reducing incentive to run, and you may reduce the pool of people who are interested, and that's, that's something I don't think we want to do. But um, I think the most important point is that other communities are not slashing this benefit, and they're paying counselors more. Just a point, can I ask a direct question? When you said there's a $2,500 more on average, you say more from 5,000 to 7,500. Yeah. So, so 2,500 more than we're currently getting, not 2,500 <coughs> more than was recommended by the compensation committee. Than what we are currently getting. Currently correct, getting. Yeah. Okay. Councilor Specter. So, I, you know, I think there are great points uh, in terms of policy, in terms of everybody getting the health care, and I, I agree with you. Everybody has the option of taking the health care. What concerns me is. It's not worth anything to a lot of people because they already have that benefit. That's what concerns me. But I'm saying pay enough, a dramatic, I'm saying not a $2,500 amount <coughs> above. I'm saying go to about 10000 above. So I'm trying to say this council really does not get paid enough. Pay it enough so that if, you're, if somebody doesn't have health care, you're paying them enough so that they can then get the health care. Right. And, so again, yeah, everybody has the option, but I mean, only, what is it, four members? I believe there are four members currently on the council who are taking health care. So the five who are not, and I would imagine they're not 
because they have health care through their work. And um, I don't know. Councilor Carney. Um, I, I tend to agree with um, the points made by Councilor Adams. Uh, just in full disclosure, I, I uh, while I would be better off with a plan as recommended by Councilor Spector, because I don't take the health care, uh, I don't take the health insurance right now. I reason I don't take it is because I'm fortunate enough to have a job that provides me with an excellent health insurance policy and ones that one that's probably better than I would get through the city. However, I take heart in the fact that should I lose my job, I mean, I'm a state-funded position, that in my second job, health insurance would be available to me. It is something that, you know, it's, a, it's a, an added insurance, even though I'm not taking it, I, I appreciate that fact. And so I don't, I don't feel that I'm at a loss. I think of health, health insurance is there if you need it. I, I don't think so much of it as in the monetary aspect. It's for use um, should I need it. And uh, in the same way that many plans, everybody pays the same. I, I, I also came out of the building trades where everybody paid the same for, the, for their health care benefit, whether, they were whether it was a family plan or an individual. So there was a sense there that everybody's paying and it really, you're, you're not penalized if you need to use it. You, it's, everybody pays. So my sense is that something that, uh, it, and we go back to what Councillor O'Donnell pointed out, that um, um, if anything, I would, I would be more inclined to providing be better access to health insurance by all, by all uh, city employees at whatever level, more access rather than l more limited access. So I, I do support the proposal that's, which is basically leaving things as they are, do not eliminate anyone's op opportunity and access to health care benefits. Well, let me try another angle and say, okay, for the council, I can even come around, I said at the beginning, uh, I just don't want to see a I want to see enough of a salary increase in addition to the benefit for this council. And I'm leaving this council. I do not believe councilors are paid enough for the amount of time that they spend on this job. And so I think all of you deserve, who run again and win again, deserve a raise. But I do want to then address the issue of Smith Smithvoke and the school committee. And we can sit here and say, well, we want to make it, you know, access to all. That to me, and I'm going to get in a lot of trouble on this, but I do not believe that folks serving on the school committee in Smith Oak come close to the amount of work that city councilors do, just in the nature of the job and the job description. And so there, I think, if you look at the amount of salary and that they're getting health care, which is very expensive for the city. I mean, it just is. We've got to look at this. We have to look at it from two angles. Both we want the policy piece, but from a budget piece, that we have five members of the school of the of Smith Volk, and I'm going to forget how many. What do we have? Seven uh, school com nine uh, nine. So that's 14 people, of which quite a larger number than on the city council are taking the health insurance. That is a that's a pretty nice benefit for somebody who is going to a meeting essentially once a month, about 10 months of the year, and serving on one committee outside. Twice it's a, every other week. Twice a month. But it is definitely not the job in the job description that the counselor have. And I would say, therefore, and I don't think we could do this, but I would again say increase dramatically. Either don't increase the salary, but keep that health benefit, or dramatically increase their salary. I, I, I think the or we may not be able to do that legally. Well, I think the thrust of the discussion is terms. What's compensation and what's a benefit? And we're talking about a benefit here. So the compensation, of course, is, right. is, is for work rendered, right? And, uh, and, and I, for one, have always held that actually public service actually should come with some sense of sacrifice. But at the same time, the thing that we run a jeopardy of, and I think it's actually in, no knock on us, but the fact is your diversity of the body is informed by how how many people are going to step up uh, given given all the other constraints, you know, the opportunity to be buttonholed in every every store that you walk into, mm -hmm. and then the uh, and then you know, I I I really don't you know I 
don't like Boston, where they res they just gave themselves a raise to I think it's one hundred twenty, hundred thirty thousand dollars with office and staff. Um, that's a career. That's your job. That's I mean, this is our job. But the fact is, you know, once upon a time, the city of Northampton had a part-time mayor, and it wasn't that long ago. It was in our lifetimes, most of our lifetimes. And uh, and the 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 fact is that we. Um, serve for a variety of different reasons. I will tell you quite personally, and I don't want us to vote based on this, but I want to do by way of example, I lost my job while serving as counsel. I'm unemployed. If I, if we eliminate the compensation package in this part, it will cost me $14,000 to you serve the, benef the, the benefit pay. package. The benefit package. Thank you for the guess. Yeah. Yeah, it will cost me close to $14,000 to serve the people in Northampton. And while I do believe that I should not benefit to a certain degree where I should enjoy largesse and I would think I would only run for the package. But the fact is at that point it becomes too onerous to continue to 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 run. And it would be in and if I'm eliminated, that means there's a huge raft of people in the city of Northampton would never consider running for that very reason. And consequently we will become more homogenized with less diversity of opinion and less uh, less input. And that's that's the delicate balance that we have to maintain. And I think relative to compensation and relative to benefits is to how people approach this issue. I think we have to keep them. That's why this is actually separated is so that we discuss them on that level. And I don't think and I think unfortunately you're kind of equating the benefit with compensation. It is a form of compensation, well, but it's, it's it's when you apply for a job, you look at the package, which includes benefit and compensation. Mm -hmm. I totally agree with you in terms of not wanting to eliminate someone. So if you, you're, you would be losing this very important benefit to you. What I'm saying, just so it's clear, uh, your salary would increase dramatically enough that you'd be able to then cover it and still get the same amount of money you're getting now. And again, I would, if you're not going to be better served financially in the whole package, compensation and salary, then I would. I want to make sure that happens. That the, the whole package you're being offered no, I understood is better. Saying. Okay, I did understand that. I, and I think though, and this is the tough nut we have to crack because it is it is um, we're talking about the public's money subsidizing us, and at what point is their value diminished by how much is invested? Well, let me just say one last thing about the. If you looked at the amount of hours, and I I spoke twice before the committee that most counselors put in and you kind of just average it out that and again yes we and we are doing it even with the increase this is still a sacrifice no one listening out there if we gave even the highest increase that's been talked about should become a city councilor for the money it's never it's not going to be that you're still going to be making a sacrifice but i'm exactly approaching that kind of thing i want everyone to be able to serve that at least because of the amount of time it you put in. How about somebody who right now has to have two jobs? There's no way anybody could serve as a counselor and have two jobs, let alone one full-time job. And so if you have a full-time job, this might be at least a little bit like a second job, a little bit like a huh. second job. So that's all I'll say. Counselor Carney. Uh, I just want to note that um, uh, what's before us is a measure that would um, leave things as they are which would mean not take away benefits from any elected officials, including school committee members and, and members of the Smith Board of Trustees. I don't presume to know exactly how many hours my school committee colleagues or, school or Board of Trustees from Smith of Oak um, work, so to speak. But I know it's an enormously challenge, a huge budget, it's almost the same budget, you know, rel relative equally budget to what we deal with at the city level, at the school committee. And there's an enormous amount of engagement with parents, with, with uh, teachers, with, with the whole, uh, so it's another whole world. It's, it's running a school system rather than running a city. So I, I don't presume to say that the work that my colleagues on the school committee and uh, board of trustees do is, of a lesser nature than that. I do know that it's lesser compensated by about half. Um, 
but I don't see people pounding down the doors to run for those positions. I don't know that there's a general sense out there that these are some sort of cush jobs, you know, that you could get a, a really good benefit. So my sense is that we have really good people in the city who are willing to serve for a very meager amount of a, of a stipend that they, that they get. And they also, some, take advantage of a benefit that, that the city offers, which is a health care benefit. <coughs> and I would not want to um, strip any one of that benefit as it is right now. That's my sense. And I, w I would actually, to both Councillor Carney and Councillor uh, O'Donnell's point, is that it is actually somewhat painful that we have to discuss the value of something that should be by right. Mm -hmm. exactly. uh, and in fact, that. actually, in this country and in the state originally, before other, the rest of the country, that we acknowledged that the, the health care cost is so, ex so exorbitant in that, that the opportunity for health coverage is, it should be, I, I it, Councilor Carney made this point to me once, that rather than reduce someone's benefits, we should promote the expansion of benefits. And that's including other, there are, it should be pointed out, there are part-time employees for the city of Northampton who are not eligible for health care. Exactly. Um, that's something that we should promote. It, it is a little discouraging that we are talking, you know, the frustration, of course, is we're talking about feathering our own nest, as it were. This is considered a, I've heard it called this, this special golden parachute for counselors and, and, and described as such. And it's, it's, it's awkward because we are having a debate and some of us will be considering running for re-election, some of us might not, and some of us might not survive an election. So we're talking about whoever succeeds this, and it may be us or not, but the fact is is that I, I hope this room allows us um, to think of health care in a different way and think of the fact that it actually should be, I mean, it, it, we, we should be promoting and pushing not just for city councilors and school committee members and, and trustees at Smith Vocational, but also part-time employees for the city of Northampton that don't receive it, and people who work with other businesses. In fact, it's somewhat mandated by, that, by the state. So, um, Councilor O'Donnell. Thank you. I think what's interesting about this debate, which I think is actually it's a really good debate, we start getting into the specifics of what we think ought to be. You know, should the school committee have health care? Should Smith Oak have health care? We're picking winners and losers. And when the council president brought up Boston, not like they're our touchstone, you know, it's apples and, mm -hmm. and oranges in more ways than one. But I don't believe they did raise their compensation. I mean, no, I'm sorry, they did, but the mayor vetoed it. And when the mayor did, um, his rationale was that you can't just make these decisions, however persuasive the arguments may be. And everything I've heard is persuasive in its own way. I haven't heard anything that I just said, no, that's completely wrong. I think everyone's making good points, but good government demands that we not do that and we rely on the recommendations of a neutral committee. The trouble is the neutral committee's recommendations about stipend are tethered to health care and benefits. That's an unbreakable yes. connection yeah. because they, they won't come before us and they'll say, well, actually, you know, let me, give, let me give you a counter offer. You know, there's no negotiation. It's just take it or leave it. It's not a la carte. So I guess I offer that comment mm -hmm. about the difficulty of making any decision if, if we're not accepting all of it. But I actually refuse to accept all of it because I don't believe we should take health care away from anybody. Right. So and that, that extends not just to benefits but to, the, to all the stipends as well. Well, Councilor Adams' point about that report seems to indicate kind of a bias towards one particular issue. It's interesting because all the criteria in which everything else was analyzed created a recommendation for salaries, but then those same criteria were not applied or even addressed right. when addressing compensation. Or health care. Why that disparity? And, I, and unfortunately, we don't have uh, members of the committee here to speak to that. And unless somebody has special knowledge of that, it might help. Oh, I, I might only because I've, you know, went to a couple of their meetings. And again, I don't agree with the final. Thank you for you put it 
That's what I was trying to say at the very beginning. <laughs> uh, you said it really let well. Let me correct myself. Yeah. Um, I think the reasoning was, this is why I asked you the, to clarify, was the increase, the 2,500 above their recommendation, the, or the committee's recommendation on compensation, or was the 2,500 you were talking about in the research above our current salary? So their thinking was kind of similar to, on the same path as my thinking, which I, I certainly honor and, and you know, yield to the, uh, the knowledge of the, of the collective group here on the benefit piece. But their thinking was, let's eliminate the benefit. And I said this, if you go back to the minutes, I said this when, when I talked to the group. I said, yes, I support that, eliminating the benefit. But my recommendation for the compensation piece was considerably higher. So I don't know if that helps with the thinking of the group, because their recommendation on the compensation piece, if we just take the council for a second, then we can look at the others, was a increase over the averages in the area. So in the, what they were recommending would, would then make this council be paid more than councils in the area without the benefit piece. Does that make sense? That was their recommendation. Well, but they did, they did not take into consideration that they were, as Councilor Adams pointed out, were receiving that benefit. Those citizens that, the fact that they them. were, that they had. They right. were, they were but they, what, what perplexed me it, was it that. Did me too. They, they I, I agree that that's the reasoning. Okay. What perplexed me because they relied so heavily on surrounding communities and, and abandoned the surrounding communities comparison when it came to that because because, like I said earlier, they, they are getting more and keeping the benefit as it, that, that, that trend hasn't changed. That's, that's well, the kind of I understand. Of I was just trying to explain the right. just I May I? Just along those same lines, I did make some calls around the time, and, and certainly with regard to um, with the retirement suggestion, which w it turns out in retrospect that they could not be done if someone is eligible to participate in the retirement plan. They are. It's Mass General Law that determines that. But in fact, when I made the call down there, the folks in Boston at Parac had never heard of any community making a move to move anyone out of any person who would be eligible to participate in a retirement plan um, to make them to somehow make them not. And they had never they had never encountered that. And, and in fact, if there were a move that way, the city of Northampton would be the first in the Commonwealth. And so it seemed like. I didn't know whether Northampton wanted to be leading the charge in terms of um, removing elected officials from access to retirement benefits. I know that there are, there, and, and the number of cities and towns that limit access to health care benefits is also pretty small. They do, there are, I don't know that there are any that give no health insurance benefits at all. If there are, there is the one outlying community that Councillor Adams mentioned. but. By far and large, all are offered access to health care benefits. In point of information and fairness, the ad hoc committee withdrew the recommendation to, uh, to, yes. to yeah. remove ourselves from the pension plan. Because right. They found that it was, found that it was, it was counter to the law. Right. So that wasn't part of. I understand. Final it was illegal. That's why they did that. Yeah. Right. <laughs> was, right. I think it was noted that it was illegal, and they withdrew that. Um, what's the council's pleasure on this? We do have, we're actually talking about the, the benefits package here uh, for the council. Um, and as Councilor Spector said, and, and as Councilor O'Donnell's pointed out, they're inextricably linked. Well, I'd like to so, move the question on this benefits piece. I'd like to move the question. To vote. So, Back to what you said, but I won't say it again. Okay. So this is the, the question's been called, and this is for the uh, benefits package essentially remaining the same. Roll call, please. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. Yes. Councilor Shera. Yes. Councilor Spector. Abstain. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. It passes in first reading the benefits package. So next up, this is next. This is um, upon the recommendation of the mayor.
an ordinance of the city of Northampton providing the, uh, that the code of ordinance of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended by revising section 5-5A of said code. And this is for the compensation of election officials in the section 5-5A of the code of ordinances of the city of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended to read as follows. Compensation for officials, annual compensation for those specified below as follows. City Council President, uh, until January 4, 2016 is $5,500. As of January 4, 2016, $10,000. At large city councilor, uh, currently $5,000. And as of January 4th will be 9,500. And wards uh, city councilor, currently $5,000. And as of January 4th, 2016, $9,000. I'll accept a motion to put it on the floor. Second. Discussion. I, we've had some discussion already. Councilor Carney. Um, just w when this first came about, I did just the rough math of looking at over the 24 years um, during which there's been no increase and just did a very basic cost of living adjustment and it brought us up to about the $10,000 range. So I felt as though the recommended 9000 was in the ballpark and felt that I could support that as a recommended amount. Councilor Klein, yeah. So did you do like a COLA? So yeah, what I did is I, I just, I, I, I took each year and added each year from, from 24 years ago and added, I think, um, to 2%. Two uh, you know, I have to go back now and do my math, but I'm pretty sure that it was between two and three. It may have been 3%, but I can do that math very quickly. The report says it. Thank you. Councilor Donald, you sure. Um, I think um, <coughs> the same problem persists. Uh, I don't think we have an we have an unambiguous yeah. recommendation from a neutral committee on the stipends. Unfortunately, we're just kind of taking part of it and not the other part. Six. The tricky part is I don't support the other part. I'm glad I'm not taking it, but nevertheless, um, it's hard just to make the decision as a council. Well, as you noted, of course, and as Councilor Spector reiterated and as, as it was presented by the chair, <laughs> that this compensation actually took in the calculus that um, there would be no benefits. Um, they would, that, that this was to off, well, actually, I heard two arguments. One, that this adjusted for inflation over the 24 period, the arbitrary choice of 24 years. percent. But then at the same time, it also, at the same time, simultaneously compensated for the adjustment that would be made for yeah. purchasing Actually, health insurance if, if right. that were one. And I, that confused me, yeah. so I don't know. But that's how it was represented. And Councilor Shara has not spoken, so. I just have, um, my question is, I remember when we received the report and accepted it, there was some talk about being able to talk to the committee, and I, I, I don't feel like that happened. I don't believe it happened in any of the subcommittees. Is that right? Not that I'm aware of, no. Do, do we know why we haven't had that opportunity to but maybe talk to them about? Councilor Adams. If I remember correctly, I thought what the, what the chair said was that they'd be available, but they weren't going to come to subcommittees. If it, that's, what that's what I thought yeah. they okay, might have said. Okay, we had questions. Councilor Spector. Well, I, I, I just share the same concerns as my esteemed colleague on my right, which is you have a committee that was set up, an independent committee. It's more, it's more the perception. I certainly will support this, but it is a tough, tough one now. Not only are we, and again, deservedly giving ourselves this raise, but we're not taking the whole recommendation of this committee. And it's a tough position to do. Uh, but I will support this, knowing that, that we're going to say, look, this was the recommendation, but we recommended you double, I mean, we, some people look at this, you just doubled your salary. And this other committee said, you know, when they came through, said, you know, yeah, we'll do that, but here's what you need to give up instead, and we're not doing that piece. I think it's a tough, just to acknowledge, it's a tough thing, and we'll probably hear some complaints about it. Councilor Murray. Oh, I just wanted to clarify Councillor Adams's analysis of this, because you also did this at finance, and it was very enlightening. Uh, while the committee made this recommended new salary based on a survey of 
comparable surrounding communities and this does represent the results of that survey correctly i think you made the statement that even at these new salaries those individuals were still getting health insurance correct correct so that the salary section were following the recommendation but they recommended removing the committee said remove health care but in fact the communities that resulted in that salary recommendation those individuals got health care right. okay that's what i thought right. yeah. Right. yeah okay uh, excuse me but this is why i clarified it with you in the surrounding communities the amount on average that they're paid more than we currently are the amount we should be compensated if we were going to go with that survey would be 7500 isn't that correct? No, I, that's, he said well, that was the lowest community. Is that the lowest community, range. or is that some of them were paying the paying average paying. community? Here's the. Uh, Here's the, the list. Total compensation for counselors on average that's is seven thousand five hundred ninety-eight. That's what I thought it was. Right. So what we're we're going to be above that average, quite substantially above that average. I think it's. I think it's right. Again, I'm just saying it's, you know, it's now we're not, we've been below that average, considerably below that average. Now we're going to be considerably above that average. Councilor. Uh, anyone can certainly move to put it right at average or other amount, too, if they think it's fair. But, but um, that's, that's true. That, that's why I said that um, right now we're 2,500 below the, the average currently. Um, but Councilor O'Donnell, I, I apologize. I missed your. I missed what you. I missed your point last time. Would you reiterate that, please? Sure. Uh, from the last time I spoke. Yeah. My point was that um, we need to act on unambiguous recommendations of a neutral committee, um, and this is undoubtedly a neutral committee, the Compensation Advisory Board. Um, however, their recommendations were not a la carte. You know, we can't just take one and leave the other because they were connected. In terms of the rationales um, and so since we're not eliminating benefits as we shouldn't um, part of the rationale for the stipend increase is removed however valid the other ones are including surrounding communities and adjustment for inflation we can't know how important it is we can't we, we the commit the report can't talk to us I guess is my point we can't say so what what is it now that we're not doing your benefit suggestion and so Although we may come up with the right number ourselves, in fact, if we could go back and ask them to, to, um, to meet again and come up with the answer in light of not removing benefits, mm -hmm. um, they may come back with the same number, but we don't know. Uh, oh, uh, again, uh, when this first came back to, I tried to make sense of the fact, you know, o about how, how we would arrive at a number. In some ways, it was looking at surrounding communities, and there was an average, which meant that some were some were paid higher, and some are paid lower. We don't have to go with the average; we could go with the communities that were paying higher. What I saw was if we did a cost of living adjust, uh, adjustment for over 24 years, which is a long time to be have gone with no raise at all. Very simply, adding the three percent each year compounded brought us up to 10,164. So this final amount of 9,000 would be less than what would have been the, an average, it would be a less than 3% cost of living adjustment then, it would be a 2.7 or something like that if you actually reverse did the math to, end, to arrive at a number of 9,000. It felt like a, so just looking at that, it felt like a comfortable number for me, that it was within the scope of the cost of living adjustment uh, compounded over 24 years, not making up for the certainly not making up for the loss of any of that over those years, but just saying that if we were n if we were to have gotten a raise every year for those years for 24 years, that would that was in line with the cost of living, we would be earning 10,164 right now. We've not we haven't gotten raises, we haven't done that, and that's not the way it works, but. Now, given the opportunity to look back, that seemed like a legitimate criteria, one that makes sense. Just do that calculation. And I'm not saying that we do the calculation and pay ourselves 10164 but look and say that the recommended amount, the 9000 is in the ballpark. 
And so I'm comfortable based on that accepting the recommended amount. Oh, I just wanted to say that similar point, I guess. It's what, what, what is recommended and what's being voted on in this ordinance is above average, but it might not get, get adjusted again for a quarter century. So, right. so it, it, we might be way behind next time. So it is important to get a little ahead, being that historically we don't it takes get twenty four years to get often. Raise. Well, actually, the charter requires that the compensation board. Uh, it does, but it doesn't require any specific <laughs> raise. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the, to that point, in fact, actually, I heard it represented by the report uh, the, by the chair saying that they, in their calculus, they were considering. Uh, average cost of living increase over a period of the same period that you described, mm -hmm. which is interesting that they came up with a different, w w they came up with this number. They must not have used just As I said, that, and then suddenly, and that was the first section, then the second section relative to benefits, they said the reason for this increase was to offset what would be lost. So w it can't serve two masters in that respect, right. and that's what baffled me. And so, actually, what I'm expressing is actually, as Councilor O'Donnell described it, this. But I'm my, my the, this report actually I don't have confidence in it. I don't have the confidence that this we have. They've presented us with the material to make a a good, and fair and just decision, and it's it's and I think we, we're experiencing that frustration right now. Um, so that's me expressing my disappointment in this report um, because of these two, particularly because of these discrepancies. Um, and you know, that's on us too, because we accepted the report, we had an opportunity to question, and um, uh, I know there was some reluctance to come and speak before the council on this issue. And in fairness, I believe uh, I, I did not attend the meetings, actually I, I felt and, and now I regret it, but I, I felt that, that I didn't want to impose undue influence by my presence. But mm -hmm. I now regret it because um, clearly they needed some of the feedback that, and some of the questions I was struggling with. So that's on me as well. But I mean, I, I, we are stuck in a quandary here, mm -hmm. as it's been laid out. I don't, and now I would be interested to know how the council wants to proceed to address this quandary. Council respect. One thing we do have are two readings, correct? We do, yes. So one of the reasons you have two readings is <clears throat> to have new information, new discussions, and we could, during this time, between the second reading or even postpone the second reading, um, it's not too late to get more feedback from the committee to get their thinking on this. Um, to ask them, maybe they'll reconsider and understand, because I, I think we've all seen there was a flaw in this, we believe was a flaw in this report, in their th actually in the, the way they've presented even the financial piece. And um, so that's one option, is to, between this first reading and the next reading, um, talk to members of the committee, either, I, I'm not sure what the structure of that would be, whether they come before this committee, before the council again, whether we have them come to one of our other committee meetings. Uh, I don't know, Councilor O'Donnell, you have a suggestion? Um, I, they don't exist anymore. Yeah, but that's true. Uh, they don't exist. So they, they disappeared as mysteriously as they came. That's true. Uh, and we do have a motion on the point. floor right now. Uh -huh. Right. I, if I can just make a, also a suggestion, I don't know if the ordinance on stipends for the school committee in Smith Folk are the same conversation if we want to put them as a group, or if we wish to address it separately, but that's just another option. I, think it's a group. I, agree. I would be willing to address them as a group in terms of reading the rest through the rest of those through uh, in tandem with this rather than taking the vote on this. I think the same issues apply. Yeah. So, so I guess that would be how, if the motion is on the floor to accept this piece here, if we can Add uh, amend the motion to continue reading for the council for the school committee. Can I see the benefits the piece. That they um, you want to amend that so that they so that we could take them as a group. Take them as a group. Uh, I'm second. not. And then Councilor O'Donnell seconded. Oh, and you want to speak to that amendment? Well, I'd like yes. to speak to that amendment in that I, I just want to first see what the I forgot the compensated amount that's being double. recommended. It was double. 
Then if you look at the averages in the surrounding area, you see that this we would be, in many cases, way out of whack. If we both double, if the, again, you're looking at a job, you look at the whole package. If you take both the benefit and the increase in salary, it would be a dramatic difference between most of the other communities around our same size. In fact, there are maybe a third of the communities around us who actually pay their, I don't buy this, I, I wouldn't support this, but pay their school committees nothing. What does Amherst pay? Um, Amherst. Nah. It's not on here. Okay. What is Marlboro? What, what is Marlboro pay? Well, Marlboro's, it, Marlboro's pays $3,000. Okay. And it, it's also so 11,000 larger a city. So, so the ones that pay 5,000 are Agawam, Gloucester, Holyoke, Westfield. Many large, much larger cities, oh. Westfield. Okay. Um, so Agawam, I, think I would recommend not, so I'm just saying I would vote against that amendment and talk about this, these other, the other committees separately from the council. That's all. Okay. So, uh, Councilor Clark. I, I guess I just want to address, I want to go backwards in our conversation because I think as the conversation evolved, we started um, talking more kind of logistically. I feel like the spirit of what <coughs> I want to vote on here is about um, something that Councillor O'Donnell said about the public good and serving this community and making sure that um, we have a representative body. I mean, we need to look around here a little bit, and we're all kind of white, upper middle class people. I don't want to make any assumptions or presumptions about anybody, but I think in order to really um, encourage people who can't otherwise, and I know this was addressed, but I just want to reiterate it, to encourage people who might not be able to serve because they're raising a bunch of kids or they have two jobs, we need to be thinking about that and any way that we can respond to this um, in a way that kind of embraces a higher amount of money and benefits I think is really important so that we can encourage people and use that to do the outreach that we need to do to get people to run who don't all look like us. And again, I'm sorry if I'm making some assumptions or presumptions, but I'd like to see a more diverse body sitting around these tables. This is to the amendment. And right, as I say, point of order. Is it, was, yeah. was there a motion made in second? There was a motion made in second to the amendment. Second second to the amendment. I'm sorry, I thought you were leading up to that, but uh, um, the, and, and also a point of information, um, I've just gotten notice that the, uh, the committee has not dis disappeared. They're appointed oh. to a two-year term according to charter. So they, they, their mission has been completed, but they are still, um, uh, still alive as, a, as, a, as an entity. So um, to the amendment. Councilor Adams, did you have any comments on the amendment? No, I was just asking if an actual motion to take us yeah, was actually made and seconded. Yeah. Uh, uh, Councilor Carney made it and, yeah. and Councilor O'Donnell seconded. So the, the, the motion that we're talking about, the amendment, is to uh, address all of the uh, elected officials of, of school committee and council and Smith Vogue trustees as a package, as a group. Uh, Councilor Spector has raised objections because he feels that the, there's an uh, apples oranges issue. So, um, are we speaking to the amendment now? Yes, please. Okay. Well, I, again, one other reason that it, it, the same the, the same analysis of looking at a COLA over 24 years applies in these cases, where basically, if you looked at a cost of living adjustment over 24 years, the salary is doubled. Well, I, five I, to ten. So in that case, it there, seems it two, the thing five hundred to five to reconcile the discrepancy between your analysis and the analysis that was represented by the group, we have to, we clearly need to talk to them. We need to understand, uh, I think rather clearly, what were the criteria that they made those recommendations on and was it a COLA of 3% and was it over a span of 24, 25 <coughs> years? Was it, um, and, and did it take into consideration the compensation package? It was alleged, but it doesn't, there's a, as I said, it doesn't jive if you break it down and do the math. Um, so what I'm saying is I'm particularly uncomfortable moving forward with this personally um, because of all these questions outstanding. Now, the find that the committee is still accountable and can be mm -hmm. um, 
uh, uh, question. I think we should take advantage of that. I'll try Adam. I just I, I have a different perspective. I'm not uncomfortable moving forward. The committee said that they were not going to. They weren't interested in coming to committees, and they didn't come here tonight. I mean, it's no it's no surprise that this is being voted on tonight. Yeah. And I, I just I, I I take that as they have no further comment on it. So I, just my perspective. The, I, I I should say that there was a certain reluctance, and it took some coaxing to get them to come speak to us last time. Right. Yeah. And and, and uh, because they said it was essentially a product of consensus. It was a consensus uh, decision. I couldn't really get much more sense of what led to that consensus and so on. Um, if I, I, I agree with your, your your assessment there, but I think it's incumbent upon us to, to I, because we're asking of the public to invest more money in us, I think we have to raise the degree well, we of We have the two readings. Right. And we have the two readings. We have a motion on the floor and, and that's we have fine. an amendment on the floor. If between yeah. this this meeting and the next meeting I agree. there is enough community input and or uh, Right. And I and, and, and I think that's to. I agree and I think that's fine. I think that clearly the problem we have some work to do and clearly that work isn't going to happen until sometime after the first of the Mr. year. Mr. Chairman, point of order, we do have an amendment on the floor that we need to do something with. Well, that's, that's yeah. okay. Uh, what's the, uh, the amendment is to take these as a group. Okay. Is there any dis To no, take no. the council, the committee, and the board of trustees as a right. group. Um, okay. Council LaBarge, to the amendment. Is the clock ticking on this? No. Uh, well, it is to some degree, but we it's till June. The thing is, is that if we don't get this, if this isn't put into effect, it will not be able to take place until the next council is elected, and they have to wait there to the next municipal, mm -hmm. so it won't be f for for uh, three more years. So. Okay. My question Which is, is my so the clock is not ticking. We do have up until June. So, which we can bring in the committee or the chair yes. to bring, why would we have to do two readings next time? I hope not. Mm -hmm. We're not do, we're, we're doing one reading tonight. One reading tonight. Yeah, one tonight. Yeah. And there's, okay. a, yeah. All right, to the amendment. To the amendment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call this. So, uh, all those in favor of the amendment, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No. no. And I'm opposed. Okay, so it passes. The amendment passes to review as a group. All right, now back to the original motion. So we now review them all as a group. Um, further debate on this. Well, we're Jesse, taking them as a group. So we're taking them as a group. This is combining. All right, so the vote will be on the recommendations by the ad hoc committee, the the amounts uh, for, both for all for both for. For the council and school committee and Smith Folk trustees, mm -hmm. right. and all the recommended pay increases. Mm -hmm. And right. by the way, uh, I'll give you those other increases. The at-large school committee is currently twenty-five hundred dollars. It would be uh, as of January fourth, twenty sixteen, fifty-five hundred. Uh, same with ward school committee members, twenty-five hundred. That would be as of January fourth, uh, twenty sixteen, five grand. Five thousand dollars. I'm sorry, to, for the record. Uh, trustees of Smith Vocational Agricultural High School, uh, also known as Superintendents of Smith Agricultural School, uh, twenty-five hundred dollars currently would also be increased to five thousand. Do you guys want to do the elector of Oliver Smith? It's yeah, part of the please, package. It's okay, part the elector of the package. Oliver Smith. Uh, currently ten dollars. Uh, Oliver Smith will. That's currently ten dollars. Point of point of order. Just can I clarify something? Sure. We have no authority to raise the Forbes Library trustees or. Uh, yeah, there's zero on just, here. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah, I, I'm not sure. can't raise that. Yeah. Um, yeah, it is on the order. You're right. And we don't have the authority to do that. We couldn't if we wanted to. Um, the electron of the Oliver Smith will, uh, the recommend, the, there is no recommended raise. It stays okay. at $10. Then I think, it's fair. I think and then, okay. we're safe to keep it on. Yeah, and the community preservation at large, also no compensation. Okay. So that's what we're voting on. Yeah. Yeah. Councilor, Inspector. Well, all along, as I've said, I, because I'm not running, I was in a nice position here to advocate and kind of run some cover for people who are running again from and I have been doing that with a lot of people and I just want to say you know when you vote on all of these and you vote to double the salary for example not of your salary but 
of the school committee salary, which is why I want to separate it, that it may well be that it keeps up with you know, the cost of inflation. And it's too bad it didn't, through the years, that it, it hadn't been raised. But it's also, and I w when, when the members of the committee come forward, if they do, is to look at whether other, other school committees all have the benefits package that our school committee has. Because if you look, I, I hope you will all look at that averages page here. Because I could imagine there are a number of reasons why the public, you know, earlier tonight we said abutters to a building are going to be, you know, we should really draw them in and make sure they understand and we talk to them. Well, same is true here. We have a lot of abutters financially who are looking at our actions here. And one of the things they could look at, unfortunately, is there's an independent committee that comes forward that makes a recommendation, and we may not like it that they are looking at the whole package. What is it going to cost the city? But I think that's how a lot of people will look at it. What does it cost? And if they look at doubling salaries while keeping benefits, which is very different from what an independent committee came up with, even though we may strongly disagree with that recommendation. It concerns me of the reaction then of the folks who we are serving, that they understand more clearly why we took the actions we take, why it's important that this whole argument about averages, which is why I'm bringing up the school committee averages. It's very important to be able to say to somebody who's saying, "How? what are you doing? And I would say, well, you could say, look, this council is still only getting the average of the other councils around. And I could then say, and I think they work harder, but they're just getting what most, the average of most of the other councilors. When you start to say, wow, they're getting a lot more, not the council, but school committees, that even becomes a more difficult argument. And we're already creating, as you pointed out, a difficult argument when we're going against, which I agree with, we're going against an independent committee's recommendation. Because this is always a tough call when a legislative body, which is what they always have to do, whether it's the state or a city legislative body, has to raise their own salaries. Um, I should note that we're going to have to suspend Rule 27 in order to Move proceed. Move to suspend Rule 27. Second. Any discussion on the suspension of rules? That is to allow the meeting to go beyond 11 o'clock. I know, I know one council. <laughs> All right. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Oh, oh voting on the motion, on a roll call. No, it was the. Uh, it's just spending. eleven. No, I'm not. Meeting. Meeting. Oh, yeah. 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 Lower your salary. <laughs> meeting, <laughs> meeting is by our <laughs> rules. It won't be out here. Yes, it's spending. And at eleven. I guess if if we're still in discussion, I just want to remind people yes, oh, that that um, this is a first reading, and and I I I, was, I understand what Councilor Spector is saying, and expect then that at the January 15th meeting, we will have a full house of people who will let us know the concerns that they have about mm -hmm. raising, the, raising the school committee salaries. There will be a lot of people who will be very concerned about school committee members making too much money. Uh, m my sense is maybe, maybe not. I'm not sure, because when the whole scoop of, scope of things, people look at $5,000 and the amount of work that's required to be a school committee member, you know, they may think twice. They may think it's such a great deal that they'll want to, you know, run themselves. But that hasn't been really, um, I'm, again, I don't know that even for $5,000, people are doing this work for the money. Exactly. Especially school committee, um, uh, just from my experience of my, I have a neighbor who's a school committee person and is really quite haggard. Mm -hmm by the, uh, the challenge and the amount of reading and research and learning that, that's involved in being an effective school committee member. So if, if that is the case, we will find out at, in the January 15th meeting. And I'm prepared to hear those concerns from the public when they, when they choose to come and, uh, and express those. What's that? I think we should vote on this. And we're calling the question. Yes. Got it. Okay. We're calling the question. Oh, we had one person who wanted to say something. We do have a side here. Well, con she had her hand up. She's had her I, hand I, up. I've had I it know, up. I know, Council Labarge, you, uh, you have a floor. I think I'll have a bell. <laughs> 
Yes, I've missed you so often tonight, but you're you're welcome to speak tonight thank uh, you. this one time. Um, I thank you, Councillor <coughs> Carney. I have great concerns just even being a counselor, and I did email um, Councillor Adams of my concerns. I very very uncomfortable. Even get, talking about a race for counselors, for 17 years I did 5,000 a year. I agree about the school committee. I think they deserve a race. Counselors deserve a race. I have received calls because of the article that went in the Gazette about the raises being brought forth. And I'm talking about nice calls, nasty calls, because of the stormwater utility fee that just came onto my ward on a billing for two quarters, okay? And they feel that we are overcharging the taxpayers, and I heard the counselor say tonight about the money part of it and so forth. There are angered people out there. So I just wanted to let you know about that. My calls have not been nice. So I want to agree with Councillor Carney on it. I know some of the school committee members that work very tirelessly also. And at 2500 a year or whatever, I mean, they deserve to be commend commended on what they're doing because it is almost like volunteer work. I mean, if you stop and figure it out, we're doing five, what, five cents an hour? And every counselor does not run the wards the same way. And I did write a really long letter to the committee, to the advisory committee, about my difference between your ward, Paul, and what I do or any other counselor. So I'm very concerned. I'd like to know, where is this money gonna come from? Uh, is that a out question? Out of the general budget? Yes, it comes out of the general fund. This comes up, this would, uh, all salaries come out of the general fund. Thank you. Uh, the question is, is anyone else? No. Uh, the question's been called, which I, we should have called the question. So uh, this roll call that we are now voting on a package of the recommended salaries uh, that the, uh, on the mayor's recommendation. So roll call, please. Councilor LaBarge. Yes. Councilor Murphy. Yes. Councilor O'Donnell. No. Councilor Shera. No. Councilor Spector. Abstain. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Okay. All right. That was a tough one. Uh, and thank you for your patience and actually having a good discussion. Yeah. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, next up is the city clerk salary. There's a motion put on the floor. Second. Is there a second? Second. This is mayor. Uh, this is the. Uh, this is also upon the recommendation of the mayor. This is be ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton. The City Council assembled as follows. That Section 5A, 5-5A uh, of the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts be amended to read as follows. Uh, this is the compensation elected officials annual compensation for those specified below shall be as follows. City Clerk, until January 4, 2016, $65,000. Is this correct? No, that's not right. Uh, uh, as of January 4, 2016, 71,250. Mm -hmm. uh, well, I'll accept the motion, put this on the floor. Oh, we already did. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the, the problem with this is that I believe it can go into effect immediately. This is a year hence, right. saying 2016 instead of 2015. So, you could, uh, um, I don't know if it's Not a Scribner's error, but I mean, this is kind of an important error, too. No. You're right, it is. Is it a Scribner's error? It should be the same on both sides. Right, mm -hmm. right. But, um, 
for the an amendment. Councilor Adam. I, I don't know if you're inviting discussion yet on the. On the on I am inviting, yeah. It's uh, while I try and hash this out, sure, go ahead. Okay. Um, Do you have the question? I, I have a difference of opinion uh, on this than the recommendation uh, suggests. The recommendation suggests 71,250. Um, looking at the 23 surrounding cities benchmark average, it's 75,679. Looking at the average salary salary of comparably sized Western Mass cities, it's $74,051. Um, based on those, I'm going to propose $74,000. We discussed this in finance, and the only reason we didn't send it forward with $74,000, I was going to make that motion. I can't. I don't know if it would have passed, but I got the sense from the discussion it would have. Was because we wanted the um, opinion of the mayor to weigh in. Um, he's not here tonight, but um, I also want to point out importantly that I read all the minutes from the uh, committee meetings of the, of the compensation committee. And on October 15th, um, the recommendation was $75,000. And for reasons I'm not entirely sure from reading the minutes, they reconsidered later. But they themselves at one point acknowledged, I think, based on the fact that the comparable communities is higher, that this city clerk should be higher. And um, I want to point out that the, the workload for the, for that office, for everyone in it, but we're voting on the city clerk, you know, her raise, her salary right now. It's it's been it's been harder. They've had to do more more with less salary, and um, that's an understatement. The the clerk um, can't get regular pay raises like like um, non-elected city employees. Uh, she doesn't get regular cost of living adjustments, and <clears throat> so if it's not adjusted again in five, six, seven years, um, the clerk at that point will be that much further behind. So um, based on that, based on the what the other surrounding similar cities are doing, um, I'm going to move to uh, increase it to seventy-four thousand dollars, and <clears throat> I also have another amendment at a later point uh, to to have it take effect. I'll second that amendment. I'll second it. Twenty-three. And that's why they came right in the middle. Yeah. You want to make that point? Unless you want. So you found it. You should make it. But it doesn't. It's the the discussion was that this this one as was the only one that wasn't designated under the charter that had to wait for any municipal elections right. and that could go into effect immediately. So, so if you put it yes, I can on the charter salary. Look at these people. <laughs> right. I see. Just trying to fit it into this table. That's why I'm okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, Council Labarge, you were next. I'm sorry. Yes. Thank you. Um, I support um, bringing this up to $74,000. Looking at Agawam, at a population, they're going by populations. That's what they're doing, which was 28438 And if you look at the pay, it's $96,000 there. If you look at Northampton at 28, she was at 65,000. I'm looking at 28 for comparison. Agawam was much higher. Um, Westfield, they were at 78, so we're in between at that 74,000. Holyoke is at 75,800 and something. I mean, it's right up there. I have to say that is a department they, and for a fact, they have lost a position. It was never fulfilled. They have double the amount of work. The birthing department in Wendy's office, they're busy technology-wise right down the line. And if you look at research that's being done, some of the, the population and the cities or the towns don't have hospitals with birthing in it. So everything has changed through the state with licensings and that. So I support a raise of uh, 74,000, and there's no reasons why that that raise does not start until the physical year of January 2015. It is much different in the charter where it's not like ours. 
she can go ahead and start right away whenever we approve this. Yeah, uh, um, right. point of information, Pam is pointing out that it will go into effect. This is uh, listed this way to uh, conform to the code book because, but it would go into effect. Whatever is approved will go into effect. Um, uh, Councilor O'Donnell. I just have a question for um, uh, Councilor Adams. Um, it seems to be in, in the report, it says the current average salary of the clerk for the eight surrounding cities is 68477 Well, there's three. There's three. There's, there's um, eight surrounding cities benchmark, and then there's the average salary of comparably, comparably sized Western Mass cities, That's and then great. there's the 23 surrounding cities benchmark. Mm -hmm. uh, Councilor Murphy. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Uh -huh. you, you saw the Please. Board. Oh, no. Sorry. I think that perhaps the reason that they didn't go right. with that higher average. Um, all of the rest of these, there's been in-house parity. All the counselors change. All the school committee people change. Um, here, this is, and, and we only have one mayor, so there's mm -hmm. no parity. In this instance, the city clerk is functioning as a department head. But there are any number of other department heads in the city. I mean, there's the treasurer, there's the collector, there's the auditor, there's the assessor, that are peer department heads. And it, it has not been parity, because most of those department heads are making pretty high 60s, where the clerk has been 64. So there wasn't parity before, because these other people were in staff positions that were uh, represented positions and they would get raises periodically uh, but the clerk wasn't and didn't get periodic raises and in this insta instance I think they felt low 70s has better parity with the other department heads who are high 60s but to kick it up as high as 74 then disrupts that parity between department heads I think that may have something to do with why they didn't go with a higher number <coughs> Uh, Councilor Adams, point, you, it was at 74 at one point or 75 at one point. So, uh, uh, Councilor Labarge. Right, and there is a difference between a department head versus an elected position. Hers is an elected position. The other department heads are not elected positions. Uh, Councilor Adams, I had a question. You said you were waiting to hear from the mayor. What was? Oh that? no, no, we. No, I wasn't waiting to hear from the mayor. The reason why we didn't send it forward with a positive recommendation. Exactly. Was in case the mayor, because he was the, because he, oh. he sponsored the ordinance, in case he had some, to, did, wanted to weigh in on, did, on it, because, he, it, because it was his ordinance. Has he made his opinion known? Uh, okay, so the, all right. Oh, oh God. Uh, Councilor O'Donnell. Um, the other point for me is the same as last time. Um, the, the advisory board recommended a number, and I don't support just changing it, uh, however right or wrong we may be. Again, I think it's the issues of, of uh, process and public trust that have been raised. It's that. Uh, that's right. Just to point out, we've um, gone against their recommendation on health insurance. But uh, but but not. not for full-time salaried positions. Uh, Councilor Kahn. Well, only uh, it is curious that uh, they did actually recommend that number, the 74.3, at one point, and we don't understand why that then was bumped down. It just raises the whole question you know, we're, we're kind of grasping in the dark here. And at the same time, we have a committee that's made it known that they're not that, it, the committee has not expressed an interest in really sitting down. They presented us with a, with a report, and I didn't, and they said that they would be available for questions, but I don't think that they were interested in sitting down and negotiating, so to speak. Right. So I, I think right. that we're kind of left to make the decisions based on um, doing the best we can with what they gave us. That's respect. Yeah, I realize I'm getting a little uncomfortable with bashing this committee. Um, I think they worked pretty hard and they did the best they could. I think that now kind of going back to their minutes and looking at recommendations made at a meeting, 
but it wasn't the final recommendation. And then somehow it kind of shows something. Well, they once said that. Well, we do that a lot, too, in our committee meetings. You know, we have certain things that come forward, but they don't end up because we discuss them in, in, in a future manner. So yeah, there might have been a reason why they were at a higher salary. But I don't want to blame the committee then for then going back or claiming that they made multiple mistakes. I think they worked fairly hard. I, I do, going back to the other, I think they made one grievous era, uh, error that we're going to discuss with them. But I, I think there is, are some reasons why they came up with the final recommendation they did, and I, I can see the rationale for that. Council Ryan. It, I, I have great respect for the committee, and, and when I point out that they were at a different salary at one point, it's not to, that's not a criticism. It's to say that they were in agreement with the motion that I'm making at this point. It, 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 I certainly respect what they, what right. they've recommended. I've, I've, I support some of it, but I certainly don't feel bound to vote for everything they, they recommend simply because they, they've recommended it. But I do have the utmost respect for them, and I make that point to point out that they were at one point in agreement with the motion that I've made here tonight. Uh, yeah. Well, in fact, it is a recommendation, and by its very nature, of course, is is um, we we. But I think to Councilor O'Donnell's point is that there's there's a certain onus here that's not you, you experience from other committees. This 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 one, of course, is dealing with compensation, and we don't uh, and and compensation for elected officials is the only place we get to actually do this. The rest of it is done by executive. Um, that's the distinction between uh, department heads and elected people. Now, the, Wendy. Maza herself advocated to keep the uh, city clerk's position as an elected position, and along with that comes this kind of disparity in packages and, uh, and rewards. It's, it's what we're struggling with right now for ourselves, the same thing. So, I mean, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable with that dimension of the argument. Um, the, so we have, we have an amendment, a proposed amendment here. Um, to increase the amount above the recommendation. And so is there any further discussion on that point? Um, okay, so this is to the amended amount. Yeah, just one, I have a further amendment after this. After this one? Okay. Uh, roll call, please. So this is just to the amendment. To the amendment. We're going to have to print up some more pages for you. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me for one second. I want to get my place here. Councilor Murphy. No. Councilor O'Donnell. No. Councilor Shera. No. Councilor Spector. No. Councilor Adams. Yes. Councilor Carney. Yes. Councilor Dwight. Yes. Councilor Klein. Yes. Councilor Labarge. Yes. We have four no's, five yeses. So the amendment passes. My motion is, is if, if you've determined that this doesn't take effect immediately, my motion is to have this take effect um, um, the beginning of the new year. The beginning of the new year. Um, well, specifically January 2nd. Yes. Second. Okay. Just, so that is to add the, add the language. Um, Okay. That's if it's determined. So that, that's if we, if a, if a determination is that it's not an immediate pay increase. We want to make it start as soon as possible. Yes. To to the. So we're comfortable it's going to be. But I th so as an amendment that will lock it in. That's right. That that's say what yes. Yeah. That that covers that. Okay. So the motion is, uh, the amendment is, a mo the motion is to have this go into effect January 2nd, 2015. Is that correct? Yes. Any further discussion on that point? Councilor O'Donnell. So may, I'm sorry, maybe I missed this. It's second, not the first, because the first is a holiday? That's right, but if someone wants to do the first, that's fine too. That's just what I threw out there. Monday. Actually, I'm sure that the auditors would prefer it to start on a fiscal not on in the middle first. of a fiscal week. So on the first, first are you on saying the, first the, audit, the auditors would first, prefer yeah. the first? Oh, oh. Salary, not a I, I don't know what it is. I think it's the, the, the oh, whatever the ends month. on the 28th of December. I'll, I'll just, for, just to make it easy, I'll, I'll, cha I'll withdraw my motion. My new motion is January 1st, 2015. Second. 
Councillor uh, Murphy to the um, Maybe we would like to check for second reading to see what number they can actually yeah. work with. You know, because we can always add this at second reading yeah. and then you can go to the auditor and say, okay, if it, we can, first of all, confirm does it or doesn't it start? And if it doesn't, they could give us a date to use it would be correct that wouldn't make them all crazy. Yeah. Right, I mean, so it's going to be part retroactive. Part of the challenges of the second vote on this exactly. comes up it comes two out, weeks afterwards. So yeah. you can't, right. it's post dating a check, basically. And so, so I, I, well, I accept. It's not authorized anyway. So, so we anyway. solicit uh, the auditor's oh. opinion on that. Would you be comfortable with that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, can. I believe Wendy believes that she's not entitled to retro, so. So it would be on the day of the second reading. Mm -hmm. So unless would you amend second, your we did a second amendment to the, the tonight. Uh, uh, January 15th? To, to the date of approval? To, uh, uh, yeah. yeah. How's that? Date of approval. Perfect. Thank you. So the amendment is uh, now to that it goes January into effect 15th. on date of approval. Okay. Date of approval and leave no date on there, just date right. of approval, final date approval. approval. January okay. 15th. <coughs> that would in all likelihood be January 15th, but I can't guarantee any vote. So. Um, all right, to that amendment, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. That's not for an opposition. Okay. okay. <laughs> Did you oppose it? No, he was. He was, <laughs> was a late eye. He was a late eye. He was. Aye, aye. He was, he was opposed. <laughs> aye, aye. <laughs> what? Voted against us. It wouldn't be unprecedented. Why? <laughs> Sorry, okay. you're killing me here. All right, well, yeah, I know we're getting, we're all getting punchy. Yeah, so Hopefully, if it, only one more thing about. Yeah. All right, the next one is the mayoral salary. Hopefully, um, well, you uh, didn't vote on the whole thing. Oh, I'm sorry. Jeez, yes, that was the <laughs> amendment. Okay, so a roll call, or actually, is there any further debate on uh, as amended, Councilor O'Donnell? I, I wanted to vote yes on this, but I can't because it's been changed beyond the recommendation. So, understand. <laughs> Uh, any, any other comments on this? Roll call, please. Councillor O'Donnell? No. Councillor Shera? Yes. Councillor Spector? Abstain. Councillor Adams? Yes. Councillor Carney? Yes. Councillor Dwight? Yes. Councillor Klein? Yes. Councillor Labard? Yes. Councillor Murphy? Yes. It passes in first reading. So now, next up, the mayor himself. Um, that's just damn city clerk. Let's <laughs> open the. Hang on a second. We lost the mayor. We're through the lost the mayor. Okay. Here, I got it. Okay. This is upon the recommendation of City Council President William Dwight. Uh, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, providing the Code of Ordinance of the City of Northampton that subsection 5-5A of the Code of Ordinances of the City of Northampton be amended to read as follows. Compensation elected officials and compensation for those specified below shall be as follows. Mayor, currently until January 4, 2016, after the municipal election, $80,000. As of January 4, 2016, would be increased to 92500 <laughs> I'll set the motion. Move to approve. Second. Motion to remain seconded. Discussion on this one. Sorry. We're talking about, and as I pointed out, he, uh, all the other stipulations in the charter has it after the next municipal election, with the exception of the city clerk, and, um, and then the mayor. Of course, the mayoral term is now four years, and this would come in the middle of. The, the mayor's term, or not quite the middle, but the so, um, and thus a conflict was developed. Councillor O'Donnell. Yeah, if I could speak to that point. Please. Um, in general, I think the elected official salaries are different than the stipends fundamentally. That's why I want to vote yes on the clerk as recommended. And I also think the mayor deserves the salary that's been recommended. It's a full time job, it's a really hard job, and I think there's no problems in the report in terms of the number that's recommended. But in fact, as the council president points out, the mayor does have a four-year term. So in the ordinance committee, I raised the issue of whether that would be a problem. And there wouldn't be a problem in terms of the charter. The charter is clear that these changes go into effect after the next election. However, there's state law, um, state ethics law, in fact, 
that says you as an elected official can't take action on something that you would benefit from financially in the foreseeable future or within you know reason. That's why we wait to 2016 to change the stipends for the council. Um, for the mayor, um, you know, I think um, best practices dictates that salary increase should go into effect for January 1st, 2018. I know it's a long way off, but it's a natural consequence of having a four-year term. In response, um, I'm actually grateful to the mayor and the solicitor for writing a thoughtful response to this in, in the opinion that the council president mentioned. And the opinion says that actually there is no ethical problem under state ethics law if the mayor uh, does take, takes no action, right? So I want to be clear that my concern has nothing to do with ethics per se. Nothing is, no one has done anything unethical. No one is going to do anything unethical. Um, but the mayor certainly cannot sign the ordinance, and the mayor can't veto it. So my concern is, is still there, because um, what does it say that we're passing an ordinance that the mayor can't veto? The mayor is legally prohibited from vetoing an ordinance. I view that as encroaching on the, the basic powers he has as the mayor under the charter. That seems like a strange legal animal to me. Um, and so when that is, happens, I think that's why it's a best practice to not have the salary of the CEO of a city go into effect until the next term of the mayor. So I think it's still a problem, and for that reason, maybe I won't do it now, but I eventually will move to change that. Um, I agree. I think that by state law, the, the one time the council doesn't vote on a financial matter should be all of these raises, and there should be some other entity that does it. And that would avoid not only the conflict, conflicts, but a lot of a lot of the issues. Um, I wish there was one exception in the law that allowed for that one financial expenditure, or that that one recommendation that we would have no authority, and, and another committee would have that authority entirely. Um, speaking to the mayor's increases, um, the, the 23 surrounding cities benchmark average was 90,921. Uh, the three comparable cities was 9,000. 92,595, and the comparably sized Western Mass cities was 88,797. So it's right in the ballpark. Um, I also support it, and I support the mechanism that was uh, derived at um, by looking at what available options there are to us. I think the charter is a document that says, you know, that shows wh what we do in circumstances. This is, I, I don't see it as necessarily a loophole or a way around. In this case here, it strictly says that, you know, the, it, we're getting past a, a possible ethical vi uh, issue. And to do that, the, the mayor um, doesn't sign a document. It goes in effect, just like any other document that the mayor would not sign after the 10 days, it would go into effect by virtue of, so I mean, even though it's not used very often, the mechanism exists and it serves a purpose. It allows the mayor to get a raise rather than having to wait another four years, which I think is a legitimate, <coughs> a good reason for it. We have, <coughs> even though we, you know, we're not talking hypothetically here, we do have a person who is doing the work and in the office right now, and, and the position does deserve the raise, so I'm willing to support it. Uh, um, I'm, not, I'm not very good at math, you know, but I remember from from school looking at uh, logic problems, and you assess you assess a logical statement based on whether it's valid or not. And if you put some inputs into it, it might be valid. If you put other inputs into it, it is invalid. In this case, I think the ordinance functions because I don't expect the mayor to veto it. But what if we were to pass an ordinance? What if this said we want to raise the mayor's salary to, to half a million dollars? And the mayor said, no, I have a fiduciary, have a fiduciary responsibility to the city. I'm going to veto this. You legally can't. So this ordinance isn't valid. It doesn't function. And that's why it's best practice to not do it until the next term of the mayor, even if it is, in fact, ethical and legal, which I believe it is. Hmm. Uh, Councilor Ryan. I guess I, there would be, a, would there be a certain point? That, I mean, at any, the mayor would always have that conflict, correct? Right. Th that conflict will always he be there no matter what. change it. And, and how would you go about amending that? I would amend it to January 1st, 2018. <coughs> the mayor couldn't sign it in at that point either. 
Yes, you could, I, because uh, it wouldn't take effect during his current term, mm -hmm. according to the yeah. solicitors. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Same thing that happens with us. You could also veto it. Well, are you saying no? So that would that would then not allow this mayor to take um, the pay raise at the at the next municipal election? That's correct, which That's I correct. which I really regret because, like you, I think the mayor deserves it, and it would be appropriate if we could just do what we wanted. Um, but why not then just let the next municipal municipal election come along, mm -hmm. and the mayor get the raise, and then you go ahead and change it for the next time? You know, in in such a language. That doesn't say that says coincident with every four years. Well, I, I don't disagree that that should be the language, but um, today it says after the next municipal election, and I just think that is not a best a best practice generally. And I think one of the reasons why why is because it it legally binds the mayor. The mayor can either violate state ethics law, which he won't do, or he can. Um, he's, or he's legally accept, uh, obligated to not do anything, and he, his his hands are tied. You know, he couldn't veto this. Couldn't mm -hmm. right. Send it back for changes. You know, yeah. Okay. That's why. Or just extend the sentence yeah. to say the next municipal election for that office. For that office. For that office, and that will potentially solve the problem. The mayor mm -hmm. is the only anomaly, and. Yeah, that's right. So the ne next to municipal election for that office would solve the problem because it's the next municipal election for that office is every four years. If you were talking, if I may, you were talking about amending the underlying ordinance that we right. that we look at when we set up these advisory. Yeah. I, I just want to point out that the last mayor did receive a pay increase, and it was immediate. We, and it's only, and that's why I was surprised when I saw the recommendations that the, you know, this salary w uh, recommendation came increase, but that in fact we were going to have to wait until not only, you know, not four years, or even two years from now. So it was, I remember that the last time it was immediate, well, it was because of the charter change. Well, the and for point of information, the charter actually because of the charter change, the charter actually subscribed to best practices yes. in, in in each aspect. Yes. Um, the the fact that there's this discrepancy with city clerk and elected official, right. but has no has no control whatsoever other than lobbying right. uh, over their salary. Right. The mayor has to have some final signatory authority mm -hmm. on this, and they still chose to cho to allow it to occur at the next municipal election, knowing that. They were also recommending a four-year term, so that it was. I mean, this is clearly came under their consideration. As to the ethical point, and, and you're right, it's. it's uh, I take your point. The difference between uh, adhering to ethical standards that are established under law, and actually, and the best practices notion of of, you know, essentially, the mayor. He's kind of hamstrung here, but the fact that the mayor, there is a way out by the mayor not signing, that rule actually exists for circumstances similar to these kind of weird things where that the mayor, if the mayor refuses to sign, the reason they gave it a 10-day uh, uh, period was so that they couldn't basically draw veto, just sort of not sign it, never be enacted in law. Um, and that was to create a best practices situation so that the mayor did never have to affect a veto but could do a pocket veto essentially by not allowing it to function. This is kind of a reverse of that situation, creates a, a, a problem that I actually appreciate your scruples as expressed here. I think that, that they're, they're spot on. But then I look at it, I look at this fact that the mayor currently is paid, and then actually the mayor has never asked or solicited a pay raise, but the mayor is paid 65th. There are teachers in the schools that make more than the mayor. The mayor is the CEO of this enterprise. Um, and, but the fact is, when we argue about salary, we argue about how we can attract uh, uh, qualified people for the mayor. Well, we don't have to attract this mayor. He's already elected. He's, he's already in. He, he bought that. 
and and I think he's prepared to live with the salary that he's got, but I think that consequently there's also the extent of uh, he's sort of like an NBA coach on some level. He's got a team that's all paid more than he is, significantly more. He's supposed to preside over all these people who make s substantially more money than he does. And he has to tell them to run laps, and they can tell him to go pound sand. But so I mean, this is the quandary. I, have. I think I think you bring up a valid point. I, but at the same time, I also think that there's an opportunity because of, and again, this is a flaw in the language that we keep bumping up against. And how do we address these flaws? Do, uh, and we've dealt with this over and over again. And if there, and I, I, I just think that there's an inelegant way to address this. That, and I to correct something that I think is a wrong. I think that this salary uh, that, and the problem is, the reason we have this ad hoc committee is because this has always been a political issue. It's always a political issue. And consequently, no one necessarily had the political courage to impose the salary to a point where it should have been and it should have been appropriate. And I, I'm, I'm more pulling towards approving this than disapproving at this point. Uh, Purple question. What do you think our ratings are at this point? Oh, Can zero. I call a question? <laughs> uh, well, that's two questions. <laughs> uh, uh, Councilor, would calling you a question. Point to make that. Well, I would like for just for the sake of due diligence, and I don't know if this will even find a second. It may not, but I would I would move that these two dates on the mayor's ordinance be changed to um, January first, two thousand eighteen, which is the first Monday of, of that year and on the first day of a new term for the mayor. Mm -hmm. It should just be one day. I don't understand what he's trying to say. This would be his current salary. Right. And this would be. That would be the recommended salary to go effective 2018, January 1st, he's saying. But right. So this would be until, until it would be the current. And then it would just be one day that would be changed. One day. Right, exactly. The the the, the, the columns on the left stipulates what his current salary is. It would be, remain that way, and the only date you need to change is the final date. And the then you'd have a gap of two years. Yeah, we have to approve a fifty thousand dollars salary, which is actually what it is currently standing. And I we're amending a salary, so you have a motion, but not a second. Right. Well, we're trying. I think we're trying to hash out uh, the. But my motion is it not correct that my motion would change? Uh, it would then read until January first, twenty eighteen, and then as of January first, twenty eighteen. In other words, before and after. Okay. So we're. Oh no! No, you're absolutely right. Yeah. I missed it. You're absolutely right. Yeah. It has. Yes. Yes. Only the second date. Right. Only yes. the second date needs to be changed. Thank you very much. Yeah, I would, so my motion to, for clarity is I would amend the second column to say as of January 1st, 2018, beneath that is 92,000. Right. Is there a second? <laughs> no second. <laughs> no second. So uh, we are back to the original. Um, requires a super majority. Uh, and it requires a simple majority. The question has been called. Super. Super majority on this. Thank you, Councillor. The uh, and the question has been called, so roll call. Councillor Sheriff. I don't yes. care. Councillor Spector. Yes. Councillor Adams. Yes. Councillor Carney. Yes. Councillor Dwight. Yes. Councillor Klein. Yes. Councillor Lavard. Yes. Councillor Murphy. Yes. Councillor O'Donnell. No. I believe a supermajority has been realized, and it passes in first reading. Okay. So. Should we move on to the next page? <laughs> Please. <laughs> uh, we uh, now are up to uh, an ordinance pertaining to the best management practices for stormwater as part of the site plan review, and this is for referral to ordinance. Move, move to refer them all as a group, all the referrals. All the referrals. That's, yes. that's also the ordinance regarding, uh, uh, I, I'm sorry, the uh, regarding um, 
Section 280-4A and 280-6 Stormwater Flood Control Utility and also an ordinance to correct errors in Chapter 312 Vehicles and Traffic, all to be referred to ordinance. And Councilor O'Donnell, you want to speak to the referral then? Oh, please, yeah. Um, the ordinance pertaining to best it's just also be referred to the new uh, council public works committee yeah. as well as the plan agree all right so that's the amendment for those two orders and to also be referred to the the board of public work uh, the the the, <laughs> the public works committee public and the council committee. the council is that what that is oh yes it is. i'm sorry the new just committee. a quick council. point the members of the committee we should decide soon now that we actually have something referred to to the committee, or one of them email you guys tomorrow. Okay, well, all right, hang on. So the referral's Sorry. been made, it's been seconded. Thank you. All right, so those are uh, amendments have been made. Yeah. Councilor Murphy? I just a question did, yeah. did the one on vehicles of traffic come from PT? Yes, it had a positive recommendation. Okay, so it doesn't, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. All, all right. If I may, I'd also like to, uh, the other stormwater ordinance should also be referred to the committee on uh, public works. Right. Well, that's what I thought. That's oh, what I I'm understood sorry. you to say. I'm sorry. So, as I understand it now, yeah. the 14.331 uh, and 14.333 are to be referred to ordinance, uh, the Public Works Committee, and uh, also the planning. However, I don't. I don't think we should refer 14.333 to the planning. Got it. All right. So, ready, Pam. 14.331 gets referred to those three committees. 14.333 gets referred to ordinance and to the Public Works Committee only. And then 14.343, the original reference uh, stands to ordinance only. Is everyone up to speed on this? Everyone understands what the motion is for those referrals? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Say that that I heard. <clears throat> so 14.331 is going to the, DP, the council DPW committee. Yeah. Is there anything else? Public Works, Public Works Commission. Yeah. And uh, rules. Uh, goes to ordinance and, yeah, the... Planning. And planning was the third one. Okay. So, so the first one is the, the the newly formed public works committee that we have. The planning office, the planning board, and ordinance. So those three. Okay. So the public works commission is not. No, there is there is no such thing. So, uh, and then the second one is just to the public works committee and to uh, ordinance. To order. Okay. All no. We're about to. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? No updates from me. Thanks. Uh, and there's no information request. I'm assuming no new business. I'll accept the motion. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you all very much. Aye.